Okay, we're going to get underway for the afternoon program. So I'll take over the, the load from Dina for the next few talks. Again, um, thanks to our sponsors. A couple of minutes, Stephen. Um, and to um, all the, the workers, the worker bees, the mic runners, and uh, to Mira and Julie. Um, so most of you, almost all of you, except maybe our guests, uh, know anything about the, um, the Center for Blood Research. So the Center for Blood Research is a uh, multidisciplinary um, center at the University of British Columbia that um, uh, was conceived out of, or arose out of the um, uh, uh, a disaster in the blood system where um, the, the, uh, the blood, not just in Canada but elsewhere, uh, became infected with HIV and hepatitis. Um, there was a huge investigation as in many other countries but um, the, um, a commission was struck and the Creever, there was a report um, um, developed or put together by Justice Creever and, and really he mandated um, um, as part of the correction um, was to um, invest in uh, research in blood and actually the Canadian Blood Service was a product of that uh, commission as well. And um, around that time, so it was the early 2000, late 1990s, um, five or forward-thinking um, scientists at UBC, so that's Grant Mock, Dana Devine, who you know, uh, Chip Haynes, Don Brooks, and uh, Ross McGillivray sort of got together and realized this is an opportunity to uh, develop a very unique uh, multidisciplinary uh, center where we can gather a lot of money. There was money from industry, there was money from governments, um, and they got together with a mission really to sort of change the world in terms of transfusion medicine. Um, aiming to you know, make artificial blood and all kinds of uh, wondrous things that are some of which are coming through to fruition. And they gathered together um, scientists, leading scientists from multiple disciplines. And this is an, a, a time where this had not really been done anywhere. Um, so there were over 35 investigators at the time and now there are 40 investigators. It included um, several clinicians um, from five faculties. Um, more than 100 graduate students now are involved, over 100 postdocs, um, research associates, clinical trainees and, um, and, and technical people as well. We occupy, whoops, just to go, and that, that's sort of what they look like um, in um, various older, most of them are old pictures. And you know, when you get a picture and you, you send it out, you always send the ones when you're 35 years old or younger. I'm not sure why. We never age, do we? Um, but um, so from that, we have um, investigators that, uh, we have a headquarters at the medical school, which was built in 2005. The CBR started in 2002. Um, they were, we were the, we, and I wasn't there at the time, were the first to occupy that building with about 14 investigators. The rest are spread around UBC in hospitals, um, in the teaching hospitals, and in uh, some of the other scientific institutes and centers on campus. Um, and really what we've tried to, since I came and, and before, We've tried to use some um, resources um, carefully to um, not only encourage interactions between scientists, but to um, look to the future generations of our scientists in multiple disciplines. And that means investing in our young, which means investing in undergraduate programs, graduate programs, and the uh, like um, with, at low cost. They don't cost much, and, um, but uh, with high productivity and lots of interactions, and I think we do it very well. So we have a, a small but very um, um, strong team, so that's Ed Prysdale, who's the Associate Director, and, and the Canadian Blood Services Scientists. Um, that's Julie, who you know, who's the Education Program Manager, and that's, that's her sole job, really. And then Mira is our Office Manager, and that's the extent of the team. You can see from, um, many of you have seen this publication around and received it. That's really generated entirely by students. So those, uh, that's a product of their work. They write, um, there's a knowledge uh, KT um, program where they write on all kinds of topics. So I have to sort of sometimes encourage them a little more science, a little more science. But, uh, but they write on all kinds of stuff from ethics to, uh, to their boat races, to football, to you name it. Um, and it, I think it, it does wonders in terms of communication, not only in science, but non-science and to non-scientists, which is really important for us. None of this happens. Uh, 
up, or let me just continue, this is sort of the, the ring, research training and um, clinical care, that's sort of a list of all the different kinds of programs we have there. Um, this is one of those programs, we have two major symposia actually, and then a CBR research day um, in the summer. Um, and this obviously doesn't happen without the support of our donors, and our donors have been really um, um, consistent throughout my time here and um, we rely on them and I think they really enjoy these kinds of, of, of interactions and they, they draw benefit and um, um, in spite of tough times for them as well, um, you may not know that, but, but they do and they have to um, distribute their resources carefully across the country and elsewhere and they're really devoted to our center so we're really pleased. So that's a little bit of a window and with that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker for the afternoon. So our first speaker, and then let me just, I'm doing IT here as well. Okay. So our sp first speaker is Stephen Spitalnik, um, who has flown in from Rome um, and um, just, uh, he really doesn't live there. I, I, at least I don't think so. No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but he did fly in with his wife from um, Rome yesterday, uh, so he's, um, uh, uh, just excuse him if he sort of falls asleep at the podium. Um, following his uh, undergraduate training at Princeton University and a medical degree at the University of Chicago, he pursued residency training at the University of Rochester and um, followed a postdoc um, there and then at the NIH. After holding faculty positions at University of Pennsylvania and the University of Ro Rochester, he uh, became the vice chair of laboratory medicine at Columbia University, a position he currently holds, and he's all, where he's also a professor in the Department of Pathology and Cell Biology. He's held multiple leadership um, positions in various organizations, including the AABB and ASH. Um, his research initially focused on glycobiology, which is uh, one of those fields that are mysteries to many of us, but um, I think most of us, but, um, but appropriate in the uh, transfusion medicine world. Uh, for the last 15 years, though, he's been uh, using numerous uh, approaches in vitro, in vivo, mouse models to understand the consequences of red cell clearance in several settings, including um, um, transfusion, during transfusion reactions, G6PD deficiency, and malaria. He's won many awards. I won't go through those because we don't have time. So, Stephen, please. Thank you, Ed, um, and thank you to Ed and Dana for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here, even though I don't know where I am at the moment. But um, So uh, these are my conflicts, which I don't think are relevant to what I'm talking about today. Um, they're relevant, but not to today's topic. Um, and uh, I, it's really a pleasure for me. I, I, it's not my laboratory anymore. It's, uh, it's a laboratory that's a consortium arrangement between five faculty members who were incredibly wonderful, generous, and, and fun to be with in the last 10 years. have probably been the best years of my life in, in research because of, of these people. So the, one of the overriding philosophical questions we have in our lab is, uh, could, can uh, blood products be changed into pharmaceuticals? Why we think of transfusion medicine as, as something special, but uh, one could think of it as just another branch of, of pharmacology, and, and that's been an overriding question for us uh, for years, and, and the issue is can you change complex biological products into pure drugs? And uh, my favorite example is this. I actually did wake up with a headache this morning, um, and I could have brewed myself some uh, white willow bark tea, uh, which would have cured the headache, uh, but the, the medical model is to figure out what the active ingredient of that is, purify it, synthesize it, and use it in as pure form as possible, knowing what the, both the intended and unintended consequences of that are. Now, applying that to blood products when I was a resident uh, would have seemed uh, ridiculous. Um, and this is uh, from, I'm an American, I'm sorry. Um, this is what the FDA uh, uh, talks about when they talk about uh, a medical model of a pharmaceutical. What are the active ingredients? How pure is it? What else is in there? How does it work? What are the dosages, et cetera? And again, we don't necessarily think this way with blood products. And so 
When I was a medical student and resident over 40 years ago, the way we would treat hemophilia would be to give cryoprecipitate. Um, that was the standard of care. Um, if we did that today, that would probably be malpractice. Um, now we use uh, recombinant, primarily recombinant factor eight, which would have seemed like a pipe dream uh, 40 years ago. Um, that may be even more complicated in, in, in red cells, which are the main object of, of our interest. Um, and part of the problem is I'm not even sure what red cells are or what is a unit of red cells. This is uh, just a list I've come up with and, and I'm sure I've left something off the list. So when we talk about transfusing red cells, are we talking about whole blood? What kind of uh, anticoagulant storage solution are we using? Are they packed? Are they leukoreduced? Are they irradiated? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and so it's actually quite complicated to think about when we transfuse red cells into a patient, what are we transfusing? And it gets worse with a topic that I'm going to talk about today, about donor variability. But what Dana and, and the Canadian group has done very well is also looked at manufacturing processes, practices. Basically, in the United States, every different blood center does things differently. And so are the red cells that you get from one blood center the same as the red cells you get from another blood center? Uh, recent data suggests that oxygen saturation during the storage period change is wildly variable. Um, and then we do crazy things like cell salvage during surgery where we're not even involved. There's some perfusionist who collects the shed blood, washes it, and infuses it back into the patient. What's up with that? What is the quality of, of that product? Um, now, all of this may change 40 years from now. I, I won't be here, but maybe it'll happen faster than that with blood farming or, or making blood from um, IPS cells and, and things like that. But for the moment, um, that is not available as a, as a therapeutic. And so our approach has been recently is what about making better starting material? If you were in the white willow bark tree business, you might think about this by breeding white willow bark trees to make trees that, had, that were more potent in, in terms of the tea that would cure people's headaches. Um, we've taken the same thought process as to can we make better donors or, or can we choose better donors to make better product? So in order to think about this, what do we know about refrigerator-stored red blood cells? I'm going to summarize it very briefly. The, again, the FDA in the United States, um, as storage time increases, we know that uh, there is some uh, red cells blow up in the bag. And so when we do a transfusion, we are infusing free hemoglobin and other cytosolic contents. And we also know that at the end of storage, the FDA decrees that on average 75 percent of the red cells still need to be circulating 24 hours later. So we know that we're not giving an optimal dose if we're waiting uh, 42 days before transfusing the red cells. We're only giving 75% of the optimal dose. So what happens during refrigeration? Um, I think the best way of thinking about this is, is visually. This is what red blood cells look like fresh with a scanning EM. They're beautiful biconcave discs, and just like you see in every textbook, this is what they look like after 42 days in the refrigerator. So there are echinocytes and spherocytes and vesicles and garbage and all sorts of other things. This is what we transfuse into patients. And this is, at least in our institution, this is not a rare event that we transfuse 42-day-old blood. So lots of people have studied this. It's called the red blood cell storage lesion, which probably encompasses about 50 different aspects. I've just highlighted, these are my favorite ones, and I've just highlighted uh, four of them in, in red because I think they're relevant to the points I want to make. Um, and so, although there's a lot of controversy about red cell storage, I, I think there's a general agreement that the sort of final common pathway or underlying mechanism is as red cells are sitting marinating in glucose in the refrigerator, um, they have decreased deformability. You saw this in the spherocytes that I showed you. They express more eat me signals on their surface like phosphatidylserine. They express less amounts of don't eat me signals like CD47 and they undergo hemolysis in vitro and they're cleared uh, in vivo by both intravascular and extravascular hemolysis. So how do, we, how do we measure red cell uh, quality in terms of red cell recovery? Some people measure red cell lifespan. I'm going to focus just on red cell recovery, the 24-hour recovery. We use the same method that was pioneered 50 or 60 years ago, which is to label a small aliquot of red cells with radioactive chromium. It's 
not very much, it's less than a chest x-ray worth. Um, you inject that into a recipient and then you take time blood samples and count the amount of uh, accounts that are in this gamma emitter and figure out what the recovery is. And so in the graph at the bottom, the red curve is what you would see with fresh red blood cells where basically 100% of the red cells are still circulating 24 hours later and the blue line is what you might see in uh, red cells that are at their storage limit 42 days uh, in humans in America, uh, which is about 75% recovery. So uh, I like this paper from uh, our friend Larry Dumont, who's done many, many of these red cell recovery studies, and these are the results of over 600 red cell recovery studies, where the percent recovery is on the x-axis and the percentage of donors in that um, uh, realm are on the y-axis. And these are autologous donations. So this is a patient donates their own red cells, you wait 42 days, you ra radio label some with chromium, infuse them back into that recipient. And you can see that on, on average, the red cells are, are even better than 75%. So the average is probably 80 to 85% of the red cells are circulating. This is wonderful. If it's F FDI, FDA criteria, everybody's happy. Um, but there are also a few people down here whose red cells are crummy. And after 42 days, only 35% or 40% of those red cells are still circulating. Yet, we have some of those donors, I'm sure, in our blood supply, and we're transfusing them into patients. And so that's disappointing. But then there are these other guys uh, on the right, right, yes, um, who uh, even after 42 days, 95 or 100 percent of their red cells are still circulating. So what's up with that? And is, is there a way we could understand that and move everybody to the right? Could we change poor stores into regular stores, and could we change all of the normal stores, if you will, into superstores. We also know that, that this is in healthy volunteers, that when you transfuse patients, the results are even worse. This is a small, complicated study, but if you just look at the red box, this is the 24-hour recovery in patients receiving allogeneic red cells that have been stored for 42 days. You can see that more than half of the 75% the line, it's the dotted line near the bottom, and more than half of those recipients, the red cells didn't even, not even 75% of the red cells were still circulating. So we have the FDA criteria, but they're built on, on healthy donors receiving their own red cells is not exactly what happens in patients. We also know that there are adverse consequences to red cell transfusion. They're infectious, uh, immunological volume related. There's also um, a lot of controversy, and we're in the center of the controversy as to whether old red cells are bad for you. Um, and so is old blood bad? Uh, there is a lot of observational, confounded uh, retrospective studies suggesting that if you transfuse red cells near outdate, there's increases in infection, thrombosis, mortality, things like that. This is highly controversial. I'm highly controversial. I'm not going to talk about this. Um, if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it afterwards. That's not the focus of, of today's talk. But despite the controversy, what everybody in the field agrees is that the longer red cell sitting in a refrigerator, the worse the red cell storage lesion is going to be, and the less the art red cell recovery in vivo is going to be. Everybody agrees with that. And so why is this okay? Uh, why is it okay to transfuse uh, red cells where you're actually giving less than a full dose? If only 75% still circulating, why are we happy with that? And if the, one of the main goals of transfusing red cells is to perfuse tissues and release oxygen and take away carbon dioxide, and that's their, if you will, pharmaceutical function. And if you're only transfusing 75% of a full dose, why is that okay? And what other drug do we give that we're happy that potency decreases over time and that we think that's okay? I can't think of one. If you do think of one, please let me know afterwards. And then finally, we have to remember that it's not just the quality of what's in the bag, as I showed you with the patients, it's also the activity of the recipient's phagocyte system. Um, and so really, the quality of the transfused red blood cells and the activity of the recipient's macrophages and things determine post-transfusion recovery and red cell lifespan. But for today, I'm only going to talk about donors, and so we're going to ignore the recipient and just focus on the donor. Okay, so it, it was of interest to us for multiple purposes to know when red cells go bad. So if 75% if of the red cells are still circulating 
after you store them for six weeks? Are they okay for five weeks and then get bad? Do they get bad after one week and stay bad? Is there a linear relationship? What's going on? Nobody knew. Uh, we published a paper about a year ago. This is LDOT was the prime mover on this paper where we enrolled 60 healthy volunteers at Columbia. 52 uh, completed the study and we randomized them that they would donate a unit of red cells and we would store it for either one, two, three, four, five or six weeks. Uh, we had all the donations done in one place. We used one storage solution for everything. Everything was pre-storage leuco reduced and we tried to decrease manufacturing variability by that. Um, and then we did something that's fairly unusual. Not only did we give them a chromium labeled red cell recovery study, we also gave them the whole unit because we thought there would be interesting things we could learn from giving the whole unit. And to cut a long story into a short story, um, everything is sort of okay for five weeks and then goes to hell at six weeks. And so this graph is a, a graph of all of the volunteers with indirect bilirubin on the y-axis as a, as a surrogate for red cell clearance. Um, and things are okay for one, two, three, four, five weeks, and then things get really bad at six weeks. And we happen to be very interested in iron as a potential bad actor in, in old blood transfusions, and we see the same thing. So on the y-axis is non-transferrin bound iron, which has many bad effects. Um, and you can see that everything is good for the first five weeks, and things get bad at six weeks. We also looked at, uh, to, to confirm what I told you before, that the longer red cells are stored over time, the less recovery there is. This is the 24-hour red cell recovery on the y-axis, and you can see that at six weeks of storage, um, it's worse and there's a linear relationship. Um, I'm sorry, sorry. And that uh, two of the people who, two of the volunteers whose red cells were stored uh, for six weeks had recoveries of 75% or below. This is, sorry, this is what we do all the time. We transfuse these red cells all the time. So what influences this? These were all healthy volunteers. They were okay. They were males and females mixed together. Well, one possibility is that there are genetic differences amongst these donors, and this was actually thought of a number of years ago, so I've already showed you this slide. But this was, if you will, the original slide related to this, which is a paper by Dern and colleagues from 1966. And what they did that was interesting was on um, the x-axis are different volunteers, the y-axis is percent recovery, and they did the same donor over and over again. And what they found was that each donor was sort of reproducible. So we had poor stores whose recovery was not very good, and if they were a poor store once, they were a poor store every time. And they were the equivalent of superstores, who if they were a superstore once, then they were superstore every time. And so Dern postulated that this was due to genetic differences, which could be true. But it also could be true that the poor stores drink a lot of coffee and the superstores don't, or vice versa. It could be some dietary component or something else. It doesn't have to be genetics just because it's reproducible within a donor. But we took the, the attitude that, okay, let's think about genes and let's think about what specific genes could be involved in red cell storage quality. And we took a candidate gene approach, we guessed. Um, and so I already showed you this final common pathway of um, what happens when red cells in the refrigerator that leads to poor recovery. Well, to hematologists and physicians, this looks pretty, um, pretty, I guess I am not feeling well. Pretty familiar. Um, and it, it, looks a, it looks a lot like the pathway that is postulated for many, many inherited hemolytic uh, disorders, hemolytic anemias, where there's some oxidative stress, for instance. They have decreased deformability, increased EBME signals, blah, blah, blah. The only difference is when we talk about people with a, a hemoglobinopathy, we're not really talking about hemolysis in vitro, although we can do laboratory tests and some of them will have increased hemolysis in vitro. And so what kind of genes might be involved in this? And these are just examples of ones we thought of. And I'm going to show you some data from Richard Francis, one of my colleagues who's focused on G6PD deficiency. And so this, this idea that the red cell storage lesion in vitro leads to decreased um, recovery in vivo, Richard transposed and said, well, maybe it's insufficient protection against oxidative stress in vitro in the bag that leads to decreased 
recovery in vivo. We already know that storage in the refrigerator is an oxidative stress, and so maybe that's what's, what's involved. And so why G6PD deficiency? Uh, I don't have time to go through all the things, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's the most common human enzymopathy in the world. There are about 400 million individuals who are affected. Um, and it's a genetically um, induced enzyme variation where most people with G6PD deficiency have severely decreased activity. People like me have normal G6PD activity. And then there are very rare variants who actually have enhanced G6PD activity. And so, sorry, there was a change in the margination, but could it be that the people with uh, G6PD G6PD deficiency or poor stores, and it could be, could it be that the people with this rare variant of increased activity, could they be good stores because they would be able to withstand oxidative stress better? Um, and this is just an example from Milan, not from Rome, of, uh, of fava beans, which are the classic uh, stimulator of, of crises, the hemolytic crises in people with G6PD deficiency. So Richard's study design was again to use uh, healthy volunteers. In this case, they're all male. G6PD deficiency is an excellent disorder. And he was able to identify 10 G6PD deficient volunteers and 30 match controls, only 27 of whom completed the study. Um, we did basically the same idea. They donated a unit. We pre-storage uh, Luco depleted it. And we kept it uh, for 42 days. We were concerned about ethical issues of giving them the whole unit. If they really didn't store well, what would we be doing by, by giving those red cells back to altruistic volunteers? So we only did a 51 chromium post-transfusion recovery. Uh, of the G6PD uh, deficient people, we, we sequenced all of their exons, and, and nine of them uh, were, had the common African mutation, and one of them had the common Mediterranean Italian mutation. Um, and then we checked to make sure that they didn't have other, you know, they weren't hemoglobin S traits or C traits or, or had thalassemia or something like that. And so these are the results of Richard's study, which hasn't been, it was presented at ASH in the f fall, but hasn't been uh, published yet. Um, and so in the healthy controls, he had an average of almost 87% recovery, which is what we saw in LDOT study and what Larry Dumont is seeing. But in the G6PD deficient, uh, people, there was a statistically significant decrease in recovery down to 81%. So this is real. It's scientifically significant. Is it clinically significant? Is a, a different issue. And, and um, there were some FDA failures, if you will, in the G6PD deficient group. Uh, there was no correlation within that group with enzymatic activity, and there were no differences in hemolysis in the bag. Um, and so one of the questions is, this is not, you know, it's a 5 or 6% difference. What would happen in a, in a patient? Uh, we don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, and so what we do know is that uh, red cells do not store as well in G6PD deficient donors. We don't test donors to see if they're G6PD deficient. Um, and it strongly suggests that the red cells' intrinsic ability to withstand oxidative stress is relevant in this context. Um, but whether it's relevant uh, in acute transfusion settings or chronic transfusion settings like sickle cell disease patients or thalassemia patients who are chronically transfused or patients who had an acute intercurrent illness, so pneumonia or hepatitis can cause a G6PD crisis, what would happen if you transfused G6PD deficient red cells into a patient with pneumonia? Would that be a good thing, a bad thing? Uh, nobody knows. So the, the second uh, little vignette I'm going to tell you, there are a total of three vignettes, so this is number two, is about <clears throat> diet. So how does diet affect uh, red cell quality in donors? And we reviewed the literature and found lots of inklings of, of potential issues. And I'm only going to talk about iron today. And this is iron in the donor. So we know, at least in the United States, that we make blood donors iron deficient. And some of them we give iron deficiency anemia to. This is a very controversial topic at the moment. Um, and the ones who are iron deficient who are able to donate don't have anemia by definition. Um, and we call this iron deficient erythropoiesis. And we know from historical studies that red cells from patients who have iron deficiency anemia uh, do not have a normal lifespan 
do not store well, and here are some of the explanations for the underlying mechanisms, and all of these should look familiar by now because these are the same things I've showed you before. And so the question would, is for us was would this be relevant uh, to red cells from donors who had iron deficient erythropoiesis but were not anemic. So like many things in our laboratory, we start with mice, and so we, this is Sheila who did this study in mice, and the short answer is that the, the mice who were iron sufficient or iron replete had normal red cell recovery. The mice who had iron deficiency anemia, those red cells did not store well, but that was already predictable. And in fact, the, the red cells from mice with iron deficient erythropoiesis had about a 10% decrease in recovery. So this would be not normal, and we know that there are a lot of such donors in our donor pool. So would this be true? It's true for mice, but would this be true for humans? And so we were fortunate enough to get funded by the NIH, and we have a clinical trial that's underway that's powered to have 60 volunteers enrolled. It's a very complicated study with each donor as their own control, but basically they start out being having iron deficient erythropoiesis and then get randomized double blindly to either have full iron repletion or not and then come back four months later and do it again. And so far we've, uh, we've uh, enrolled in, and randomized 11 volunteers of which I think three or four have completed two transfusions and are, are complete, finished the study and I hope in a couple of years we'll be able to report out on that. So the, the final vignette is uh, about the environment. So what kind of environmental factors might affect the red cell quality from different donors? And there's very little that we could find in literature. So we know we have a lot of donors who are older, like me. Um, are those red cells okay? Or does something happen to red cells as uh, donors get older? We know that we have a lot of donors who smoke. Uh, there's a lot of new interest in the microbiome. How does that affect? donor red cell biology, and the, the story I'm going to tell you about is lead. Uh, this is not our work, it's, it's work that's in the literature. Um, so what is lead? Lead is a bad thing, it's a neurotoxicant, uh, there's no threshold effect, so there's supposed to be no level that's safe for you. Uh, young uh, children who are myelinating are, are particularly vulnerable, and premature babies are iron deficient, which is bad if you, if you have lead intoxication, because lead will go where iron it doesn't exist and will uh, be bad for the recipient. In New York City, the, in America, the, the level that's deemed to be safe is under five micrograms per deciliter, even though I told you that there's no threshold effect, that's what we use. And 75% of the lead in whole blood is in red cells. So does this matter? Um, do donor units have high lead levels? And if they do, who cares about that? So there was a very scary study for me from Quebec. Um, I'm not ragging on Canada, please, but, um, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So they did an epidemiological study looking at lead levels in their donors. And they, I'm summarizing a lot of data into one slide. They found that the highest prevalence of, of elevated lead levels were in frequent blood donors, the people we like who keep coming back, who are unemployed, uneducated, older males, like I may be soon, uh, who smoke, drink, and have lived in the same home for a long time. And smoking uh, cigarettes, there's lead in there, um, depending on what you drink, there may, there may be lead in there, and maybe living in the same home if they have lead-based paint in there, uh, maybe that's the problem. But those have the highest levels. Now, who cares? Uh, so this is another very small paper looking at preterm infants and looking at the lead levels in the blood they received and in their lead levels afterwards. And what you need to remember about preterm infants is we transfuse them a lot because we bleed them a lot to do laboratory testing, and we tend to transfuse them with aliquots from the same unit over and over again. So this is their data on the x-axis is the lead levels in the donor unit, and the y-axis is the lead level in the recipient post-transfusion, and this is five micrograms per deciliter, so the people on the right would be classified as lead intoxication in my laboratory in New York City. And, and this is only an anecdote, but this is one case from their study that the, the donor had a lead level of 56, so 10 times the, the, the cutoff, and the total lead infused into this 
premature infant was almost eight micrograms, and the lead level, post-transfusion lead level in this baby was nine. Okay, a premature baby, myelinating, iron deficient, got a ton of lead. What do we care? We don't measure lead levels in New York City. Should we be doing that? Does it matter? I don't know. So the conclusion from this part of the study is, this part of the talk is there's a lot of environmental factors that are possibly may affect donors when we know very little about them. So to wrap up, what, what are we trying to do? Um, I, I think if we are doing blood farming or doing what we're trying to, we're thinking about, you want to make the ideal red cell unit. So what would the ideal red cell unit look like, at least according to me? Well, the transfusion recovery and lifespan would be the equivalent to fresh. It would be like taking blood out of the vein of the donor and infusing it directly into the vein of the recipient. That would be great, because then they would be getting the full dose. We'd like there to be no white cells. White cells are really annoying. They cause febrile reactions. They can alloimmunize recipients, so we don't want any white cells there. Ideally, we wouldn't want any plasma there either, because plasma can cause trolley and, and allergic reactions and things like that. Um, it would be cool if they didn't have any significant blood group antigens on their surface, because then we could really have universal donors and transfuse any red cells into any recipient. And we'd like them to lack things like hemoglobin S and other things that might, G6PD deficiency, other things that might decrease um, recovery. So how are we doing? So um, at least in my lifetime, the, the quality of the red cell units has improved dramatically, so that there have been novel storage solutions, um, and other pe people are working on newer novel storage solutions, um, and, and maybe we could select or make better donors. Obviously, we use leukoreduction in New York. It's universal leukoreduction. There may be universal radiation, which I have issues with, but that's another topic. Um, there are some people who advocate washing all units. I think that's easy, but some people do that um, be because there are other consequences to the red cells when you wash the unit but maybe we could change donor selection uh, in some cases. Um, there are, we phenotypically match red cells for some chronically transfused patients. There are people who are advocating genotypic matching of red cells uh, for transfused patients. And we use sickle dex and, and things like that to prevent giving sickle trait units to a sickle cell patient, particularly in exchange transfusion. So these are, in addition to the pictures I've showed you, we collaborate with lots of people all over, and, and nothing would have been possible without them, and I thank you for your attention. Steve, when you do so much good work on so many topics, your team, then obviously you bring up some questions. So one is, it looked like when you were looking at the one week, two week, three week, four week, five week, six week storage, that three people at six weeks were great and it was only two who were down the toilet. Is that? That the, was in recovery, but in yeah. terms of non transfer bound iron, eight, seven or eight of the nine had huge levels of non transfer bound iron. So, so really, they were clearing red cells and you know, it, it raises the question, even though uh, 51 chromium is the gold standard, it's, it's a difficult assay and has lots of variability, and um, that's just the way it is. I mean, it's one of the reasons that we like transfusing a whole unit, because instead of doing 51 chromium and, and trying to figure out what the zero time point was, you can measure things like serum iron and bilirubin, which we can measure in a routine laboratory, um, and we get much more robust data. But that's, that's the gold standard, and so that's what we have to do and show. And what, um, could you tell us what some of the, I guess, environmental or dietary factors you would look at next? So that's a good question. I gave a different version of this talk in Rome a couple of days ago, a longer version. And, and uh, one of the questions was, well, we're, you know, we already do so many things with blood, you know, what's the, what sort of bang for the buck do you get by doing other things? And the short answer is, I don't know. Um, the longer answer is, um, you know, you pick what you think is, is going to be significant or interesting or whatever. And so we're still pursuing iron as our major dietary thing, but, but one of the people in the picture, Tiffany Thomas, who's a lipid person and a nutrition person, is looking at lipids, and she has 
some very interesting, potentially controversial, potentially wrong uh, data on uh, fish oil uh, supplemented diets, you, again using mice as a model to start with, and because um, people go and take supplements all the time and then can show up as donors and does it matter, does it not matter, and so we're, at the moment we're interested in lipids and iron. Hello, yeah, I was wondering uh, uh, if you could potentially give us some thoughts about uh, the, the, recipient, the recipient. I mean, there is the super donor, but what about the recipient? Maybe the, the, it's certain people are better at accepting store red cells than others. Whether there are super recipients, is that the question? Yes, yes. Probably. Um, so certainly uh, patients and sick patients in general are not good recipients. Um, and the extreme example would be someone, for instance, with hemophagocytic syndrome, whose uh, macrophages are so turned on that they will eat anything that flies by, including transfused red cells. I haven't really given much thought to super recipients. I mean, you, we do this in mice. You can, you can deplete all their macrophages with liposomal clotronate. And when you do that, you know, the red, even old red cells have 100% recovery. None of them are cleared. Yeah, no, I, I guess what I'm thinking in the context of in the study, you're doing the autologous uh, transfusions and you're measuring the recovery rate. But are, are those, is that the donor effect? Is that the ability of the donor to store or is that the ability of the recipient to not clear? Uh, it's, a, you know, it's the same person in that, in that case, right? You just, how do you separate those two? It's hard to do. We, we've tried this in mice. There are, with Jim, we've done, uh, well, he's done different strains of mice, and at least in the inbred strain, strains that we've looked at, there are mice who are poor stores and, and super stores, if you will, when you transfuse into a given background strain. Um, and so there are differences in the red cell storage quality that we think are genetic. Um, but when we did, again, Jim did the same study looking at recipients, there were no differences in, at least among the strains that we looked at, there were no differences between clearance. If you gave the same red cells to 10 different strains of recipients, you got the same clearance in each strain. So that's a more complicated thing to look at, but it, we're interested in that, but I don't have any more insight than what I just told you. One more question down here. Oh, sorry. If I may add on, on this question, because it's very interesting. Why don't, why don't we let someone talk who I've never met before? Sure. <laughs> no, 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 you need a mic. No, now you have to ask the question. No, you need a mic. Now you have two. Two of them. This better be a good question. Yeah, a lot of questions. Talking about genetics and blood storage, I was just wondering if anybody has ever tested the relatives or the first family members of the poor storers versus the in, in humans, no. In mice, yes. And um, although Jim is talking about platelets today and not red cells, he's done remarkable studies with uh, you know, taking super stores and poor stores and crossing them and looking at the F1 and F2 and blah, 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 and trying to use uh, mapping methods to identify genes, which he has, and I won't talk about because it it's his work. But um, so it's, I'm not aware that anybody's done that in humans, but, but certainly in mice it's been done. Thank you. Any other questions from people he doesn't know? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll go on. Okay. All right, okay. thanks. Thank you. So the next uh, guest speaker is going to be introduced by Dana. A little tag team here. Yes, we are. We're getting good at this after all these years. <laughs> you should do it again. So um, i just like to remind us that for those of you who've been at the Bethune Symposium before, you'll know that we, ha we have a tradition of having someone come speak to us who is actually on the receiving end of all of the research that we do. And I think it's an opportunity for us to remind ourselves that society supports us to do research not because it's just fun and we're in the laboratories enjoying ourselves, but because there's actually benefit to society from what we do. And this year, we're really very fortunate to have with us as our representative of the recipient uh, world of our research efforts and of blood and blood products, uh, Colleen Fitzpatrick. So Colleen, um, is here to represent uh, the, the recipient community, and she also is an active proponent of blood donation. She's been a volunteer with the Canadian Blood Services, 
but really what the story that Colleen is going to tell us today relates to her role uh, in 2016, uh, right? 2016, I'm losing years now. Uh, at, uh, on Remembrance Day, Colleen was, was named the Silver Cross Mother. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that is the recognition of one woman who will stand to represent all Canadian women who have lost uh, sons in, or daughters in, who are serving in the forces. And so that's a position that, that Colleen uh, held for a year and was, was able to make that representation at all sorts of, of events, including some of which we had some, some hallmark year events for uh, involvement of Canada in various uh, global warfare activities. And uh, Colleen has graciously agreed to come down here from Prince George and to talk to us today. So Colleen, welcome. So good afternoon, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank Dr. Conway and Dr. Devine uh, for the invitation to speak with you. Um, to start, I want to say that I have absolutely no medical background, <laughs> but rather I'm here as a mom. I'm here as a mother. And I'm here to tell you the story of my son. Now, a little bit of a preempt here before we get going too far is I might get a little emotional, uh, but please bear with me. It's something that I refer to as a speed bump. Just slows me down for a minute or two, and then I continue on. <clears throat> so this is an amazing young man, and my personal hero, our son Darren Fitzpatrick. And as I said, bear with me as I go through this. Darren was our middle son of three boys. Uh, no family resemblance, as you can tell. <laughs> Born at just over five pounds, he was nicknamed Little D by the family. He was a passionate, strong-willed, fun-loving redhead. Now, as a young child, Darren was a very special little guy. And I say that because he had a few challenges. He had lisp, he had asthma, and he had severe eczema on his hands. <clears throat> And I remember him specifically one day coming home from kindergarten and the poor little guy was devastated because the other kids wouldn't hold his hand in Red Rover, right? It's those little things. <clears throat> but you know what? Darren overcame all of these and no doubt these experiences really helped to build his caring nature. Uh, he was thoughtful and courageous with a magnetic personality and a smile <clears throat> that would light up the room to be a speed bump. So Darren loved life, and really that's how he lived it. He lived it to his fullest. And honestly, each one of us in this room could actually take a, a page out of Darren's book of life. He was generous, empathetic, and everyone's loyal best friend. I remember Darren was maybe three, if that, just a little guy, and we were teaching him the concept of sharing. And you'd give him something, and a couple minutes later I'd turn around, and he would have given away everything and kept nothing for himself. So very telling of his character. From a young age, Darren was very giving of himself, and he was no doubt always the first person to step forward to help especially anyone who was less fortunate. So this picture is Darren. He was on military leave, and we happened to be in Cuba. And typical of Darren, the communication ban, or communication barrier, didn't stop him from stopping and helping out a local. Very typical. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong, Darren was a typical teenager. And uh, he gave us a run for our money, let me tell you. So remember I said he was mischievous. Well, he was also easily bored and always had to be challenged. So with two brothers, two other brothers, they always found a way to have lots of fun. Those of you that have boys, you'll understand. Especially what we found out later they referred to as the grace period between 3 and 5 p.m. when mom and dad were at work. <laughs> 
So fun things like throwing water balloons out the vehicle window on the way home from high school or, you know, um, I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of a potato gun or built a potato gun, but anybody that has, you'll know what I'm talking about. I never had hairspray in the house and every barbecue that we had was always missing an igniter. <laughs> so that was Darren. We always found out that they were shooting potato guns and paintball guns in the nearby field and I would always hear about it from the neighbors, always. So you know, it, all having said all this, it should not have surprised us when Darren, at the age of 18, decided he was going to join the armed forces. Just in the midst of the Afghanistan conflict. So we tried, of course, to convince him, Darren, try something else, anything else. But remember I said he was a stubborn redhead and strong-willed. When he committed himself to something, that was it. There was no changing this kid's mind. So the other thing with Darren is that he wanted to make a difference. And that's how he lived. So he believed in what he was doing. And even though he was young, he accepted the risk. Being young, he also said, it helped that he got to play with some really cool stuff like explosives and <laughs> tanks, all those fun things. <clears throat> um, this is a young guy, of course, that actually one day literally blew the door off my house by putting firecrackers in a mason jar in the stairwell. I don't know how it works, but needless to say, I was on a first name basis with the high school principal and the local, local police constables. He kept us busy. So December 2006, he enlisted. I clearly remember this day. Speed bump. So this was October 18, 2009. Sending him off to Afghanistan. Bear with me. So this was a difficult day. But it wasn't the worst. That was yet to come. So, handsome young man, isn't he? It was March 2010, and we were in Mexico on our 25th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> so we received notice that Darren was critically injured. I literally couldn't breathe. It was March 6th. And he was on a foot patrol, and he was struck by an IED. His injuries were significant. As we heard this morning from Dr. Beckett, we heard about massive trauma, and that was the case with Darren. <clears throat> Pardon me. He lost both of his legs, well above his knees, and uh, fortunately for us, he was attended to by, I refer to as a very heroic American medic who actually tied off his legs, which was, you know, that's what saved his life. Now, he was bleeding so profusely, however, that he actually lost his entire blood volume. To the point, actually, um, they actually, <clears throat> pardon me, opened his chest and performed open heart massage in the field. He was then transferred, <clears throat> pardon me, by Black Hawk helicopter to Kandahar and fitting to Dr. Bethune's legacy. When Darren arrived, 19 soldiers were waiting to donate blood. So he was then again stabilized and flown to Landstuhl <clears throat> Regional Medical Center in Germany. So, not only was it a miracle that Darren survived the IED blast, as his medical team reminded us every day, but then open heart massage, a helicopter transfer to Kandahar, significant blood transfusions, and finally a nine-hour flight to Germany. This young man had the strongest will to live. So my husband Jim and I flew to Germany, and upon our arrival, we were told to expect the worst. So we arrived. Darren was obviously heavily sedated, but he was alive, so we were very hopeful. So our other two sons, Mike and Sean, 
They arrive the following morning. Now the three brothers are extremely close. I think there's three, bro three boys in four years, so they're pretty close. And I remember Mike, the older boy, walking into the room. He leaned over and he whispered in Darren's ear. And Darren opened his eyes and turned to look at his brothers. So during these, <coughs> pardon me, during these times, Darren told his brothers how much he loved them, and his only request was he wanted to come home to Canada. That was his only request. So, <clears throat> over the, <coughs> sorry, speed bump. Over the next two weeks, we spent day and night by his bedside. He would awake when they lightened the sedation, and obviously we would speak with him, comfort him, and tell him how much we loved him. Had it not been for the incredible medical team and the blood transfusions that Darren received, we would not have had those two precious weeks with our son and our brother. Now I'll tell you, he had an amazing medical team in Langstool and actually from around the world. They would video conference every morning to discuss his progress. There were many, many difficult conversations, I can assure you. <clears throat> he had surgery every second day, and he continued to receive blood transfusions. Every day, the medical staff were amazed at his progress. He actually started to improve to where the doctors were discussing prosthetic limbs. However, as we were warned early on, the infection started to set in. So naturally, we wanted to honor his request and bring him home. So once he was stable, Darren was flown home to Edmonton. He arrived home on March the 19th, 2010. Passed away the next day. He was 21. I'm almost there. <laughs> Bear with me. Okay, so in the end, yes, we lost our son. But you know what? We were truly blessed. We were. We were blessed to have time that most parents of a fallen soldier did not have. Most people did not get that experience. So those blood transfusions gave us the opportunity to tell Darren that we loved him, how proud we were of him, and to spend his final hours with him. So, for me, <coughs> blood transfusions obviously save a life, but they can prolong a life. And for us, it was precious, and it really changed our lives forever. Now, after Darren's passing, we looked at for ways to pay forward the compassion that we experienced, <coughs> and as a family, we decided that we would donate blood. And if we donated every 56 days, it would take us over 10 years to repay. So we partnered with Canadian Blood Services to start a blood drive in honor of Darren. And with the help of family, friends, and many Canadians, uh, we began our mission in Prince George. And it soon spread across the country. Uh, with the help of a couple of very close friends, one of Darren's military comrades in Edmonton, Tyler Fault, and one of his U.S. nurses from Landstuhl, Jamie Young, they organized blood drives, one in Edmonton and one in actually in Fort Benning in the United States. So I can't actually tell you the final numbers, but what I can tell you is in Edmonton, 160 soldiers donated in the first two days, and in Fort Benning, they had so many people show up that they actually had to turn people away because they actually ran out of supplies. So, needless to say, it was quite a success. We were more than met our goal of uh, paying back what Darren received, and ultimately our goal was to increase the awareness and the importance of blood donation. So that was our goal. Um, 
In closing, I just would like to say thank you for the time spent with you today, and thank you for the very important work that you do. From a family's perspective, it's so appreciated. So thank you. Okay. Maybe we should have had a coffee break at that point. Hmm. Okay. Our next speaker. Selena? Yes. Dr. Selena Montemayor, is that right? Thank you. Obtained her medical degree from Monterey in Mexico and a PhD in molecular and cellular biology from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Um, um, subsequently, she trained in anatomic and clinical pathology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and completed a clinical and research fellowship in transfusion medicine and blood bank at the NIH in Bethesda, where she, she is now a staff clinician. Her research at the NIH focuses on the application of genomics and bioinformatics in transfusion medicine. Hi, can you hear me? Um, before I start, Ms. Fitzpatrick, thank you for sharing the inspirational story with us. Um, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. It is really a pleasure to be here. Um, my goal over the next 20 minutes is to give you a broad overview of the application of next generation sequencing to predict red blood cell antigens and also to tell you about the ongoing efforts that we have at NIH to create a public tool to automate this process. I have no financial relationships and I am required to state that the views that I will express today do not necessarily represent the view of the NIH, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. federal government. So we're all familiar with the explosive growth of genetics over the past 30 years, right? From the start of the Human Genome Sequencing Project in 1990 to the publication of the first complete human genome sequence in 2004, and then escalating to sequencing many species, um, many ethnicities, cancer tissues, and literally hundreds of genome-wide association studies. This has been possible because there has been a parallel evolution in the sequencing technology, so that now we see all of this different equipment in our labs beyond the original and still gold standard Sanger sequencing approach. These technologies have increased the throughput of the sequencing reaction, but they have also allowed a precipitous decline in the cost of sequencing an entire human genome, which was estimated to be around $1,100 in July of last year. So, thanks to these advances, worldwide large-scale genome sequencing projects have been completed, starting with 2,500 individuals from five continental superpopulations in the 1,000 Genomes Project, moving on to the EXAC database, which contains sequencing information for over 60,000 individuals. There's a UK 10K uh, project, TopMed, and many others. All of them have been documented the wide genetic variation that we see across the globe and try to answer the question of what is the specific clinical significance of these variations. So we call these technologies next generation sequencing or NGS. What do we mean by that? Due to um, the shortage of time, I will only go over some of the main aspects. But in general, when you hear NGS, think high throughput and think large scale, massively parallel process. The method that is most commonly used today is sequencing by synthesis that I'm showing you here. Um, note that the library preparation starts by fragmenting the genomic DNA in the sample. That's going to be important for transfusion medicine. 
Other methods include the zero-mode waveguide and nanopores. These two differ from sequencing by synthesis because they can give us a longer read length, but they also have a different sequencing error rate. An important concept in NGS is the concept of read depth. This metric value essentially represents the number of times that sequencing reads overlap a given position in the genome. So in this simplified diagram, position number four has a higher read depth, and therefore we have more confidence on the uh, variant calls that we could get from that position. Regardless of the method, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they're going to flood your computer with a massive amount of data. Making sense of this data is what has become the biggest challenge nowadays. So they say, okay, we've reached almost a $1,000 genome, but the analysis is still very difficult. And really, we cannot just output 3 billion bersperts into the patient's chart and expect the clinician to scroll down through the nucleotides and make a clinical decision. So recognizing this challenge, the NSGRI in their strategic plan has said that the creation of practical clinical genomics information systems is one of their top priorities. And still in the last update from the director of the institute, the creation of information systems features within the hot areas in genomics. Now, we don't see here transition medicine as one of the potential applications, but we know that our field has an unparalleled volume of genomic correlations. There are 36 blood groups recognized by ISVT today with 43 genes that are associated in regulating their expression and over 1,500 alleles. Beyond that, um, we've seen that genotyping for red blood cell antigens has proven advantageous in several clinical scenarios. For example, patients that have been recently transfused, or patients that are receiving monoclonal therapies like anti-CD47 or daratumumab that interfere with some of serology assays in the blood bank. The current RBC genotyping technologies um, are based on probe array platforms or on sequence-specific primers, so they can be limited and only address a limited number of blood groups and their associated variants. So let's look, look, for example, at the FDA-approved probe array platform. Uh, let's look at the KID blood group. So this platform will assay for the JKA, JKB antigenic pair, and it will do that by using a probe that interrogates exon 9 right here of the SLC14A1 gene that is here in the long arm of chromosome 18. That works very well. But this probe will fail to detect if the patient is also carrying the jko 2 no one null mutation that is at the end of intron 5, for example, or it would also miss the missense variance in exon 10 that also results in a null. By sequencing the entire gene or all the coding regions, NGS will allow us to detect potentially all known blood group variants and also will allow us to detect any novel variant that we can encounter in the population. There are three items um, that we need to consider when applying this technology to our field. First, we have to keep in mind that alignment algorithms will take a reference human chromosome sequence and that the algorithm will do its best to fit the short reads as best as it can into the reference sequence. Now that can be a problem for some of our blood group genes, particularly those that have homologous counterparts like RHT and RHCE. Aligning of a short segment can be difficult because the coding sequences of these two genes are so similar. To make it even harder, the aligner is not even going to consider all of the genetic rearrangements that we all know that are clinical significant. So in other words, a short read that is aligned into exon 6 of the RCE gene would not be differentiated from the same read that results from the translocated exon 6 that you see in the R prime allele. The second thing we need to consider is that we need to establish a database of genomic coordinates for our field. Currently, our database of blood group variants uh, is indexed according to the coordinates of the transcript of the cDNA. For example, here, in position 838, you have either an A or a G, and that determines the JKA and JKB antigens. In order to apply NGS, we need to change it to the absolute genomic coordinate. So we would be saying the nucleotide located in position 45,739,554 of chromosome 18, starting from the short arm, if it's an A, then that would be encoding, say, for JKB. 
So our group, as well as others, have been slowly working through this process and we are creating a database. I'm showing you here only a limited part of the kit blood group um, that includes the chromosomal coordinates for the different human genome assemblies for this application. The last challenge is that to do NGS, you might need powerful computational resources, clusters that can analyze terabytes of data. So this really intersects transfusion medicine into the growing big data science field with all the associations and implications. So now we have a lot of data. We have to establish systems that assure its integrity, that make sure that it's stored securely, that we can use it again in the future as algorithms become better. We have to make sure that we have reproducible pipelines and have a really robust data management program. Over the last seven years, there's a growing number of publications that have yielded a proof of principle of this application, and at NIH, we want to create a public informatics tool that is going to automate this process. So essentially, we want to just create a machinery that is public and open source that will take NGS data as input and will yield an extended predictor red blood cell phenotype as the output. We call our software Rylan, stands for red cell and leukocyte antigen prediction from NGS. This is the overall architecture of the software. Um, due to time constraints, I'm only going to highlight some of its most unique features. The core of the software is right here. It's an app written in Python. The Ryland Core app intersects and communicates with two databases. One of them encodes those genomic coordinates and interpretation rules. So essentially the table that I showed you earlier. Rather than limiting ourselves to a relational database where we would have rows and columns and it's a very rigid structure, we are using non-relational databases that look like this. Just think about it as something as if it was clay that we can mold as we want. It provides absolute structural flexibility. We can change it, we can scale it and modify it as we learn more about the interactions between the different genomic regions, as we learn more about blood group genes and as bioinformatics evolves. Along with it is a database where the user can define the specific thresholds per individual genomic coordinate for several uh, quality parameters associated with NGS. The second thing I want to highlight is that the software uses open source freeway software for variant calling, and it'll do that in what's known as GVCF base pair resolution. Essentially, we are asking the software to give us a nucleotide call and the associated quality parameters for every position we consider of interest, whether the patient or the individual is considered a variant or a homozygous reference. So in other words, other fields perhaps care more about identifying those genomic areas where the individual is different from the reference. For us in transfusion medicine, we just, oh, it's just variety, it's just genomic variation. And I do not want to classify a patient as Lutheran B in this case, or JKA, unless I know for sure that this genomic coordinate has been sequenced enough times with an adequate read depth, has an acceptable sequencing quality, and a good mapping quality as well. And the output of the software is the red blood cell genotype and then the predictor red blood cell phenotype. And this is also provided in a non-relational database that allows all sorts of statistical analysis and bulk queries. The final item that we have added is called the Ryland Coder. Uh, we hope that this will make it more user friendly. Essentially, Ryland Coder allows any user to enter new genomic positions of interest or modify any of the positions, any of the interpretation rules, and of course, optimize the threshold parameters that are better for his or her data set. And then you run Ryland Coder, and Ryland Coder will generate the code for you. Uh, hopefully this will save the user from the headache of debugging or having the software crash because you forgot a comma or a parenthesis somewhere. So it's highly modifiable. Um, we tested it first in silico with the public thousand genomes data set, and then we are currently testing it with the NSGRI CleanSeq cohort. This is a cohort of 1,018 individuals in the geographic area of Washington, D.C. that are consented for phenotyping and that underwent exome sequencing between 2008 and 2014. It's a particularly challenging data set because it contains both single and pair ended files. And there were six different library preps used during this time and three different sequencer generations. So we really get to test the software. 
Um, so the sequences obtained from the ClinSeq um, study are analyzed through Ryland. We obtain a red blood cell genotype and predicted phenotype, and then we compare with conventional serology using blood samples that are donated by the research participants. So the first step is getting all those raw, it's their called FASTQ sequencing files, 1,018 of them had to be shuttled, and this is actually BioWolf, our 90,000 core computational cluster, for the initial alignment and pre-processing of the files, and then they are shuttled through Ryland that can run in a conventional MAC in any desktop. At this point, we analyzed a total of 398 SNVs and indels with a total of 36 genes that either regulate red blood cell antigens, some platelet antigens, and we are looking also for any hemoglobinopathies. The cohort consists of 55% males, and the large majority of this group self-identifies as white and non-Hispanic. On average, the genomic positions that we're interested in were sequenced 86 times and the quality value that was assigned when the nucleotide code was considered a variant was over a thousand. In our cohort, the most polymorphic sites actually correspond to the Duffy A, Duffy B, and the JKA, JKB antigenic sites. And the distribution of the predicted phenotypes is just as we would expect for the ethnic characteristics of our cohort. And it is the same for the distributions of other blood groups. I am showing you six examples here. So the next step that we need to do is phasing. Um, let's look at it by using the Duffy blood group as an example in relationship with the Catabox promoter silencing mutation. So this would be the genotype in the Duffy A, Duffy B antigenic site for our entire cohort. The majority of our research participants do not uh, carry the Catabox promoter silencing mutation, and they are the ones represented here by the dark brown circle. So for them, the predicted Duffy phenotype is as it is expressed in the genotype in the inner circle. However, 25 of these individuals that are homozygous for Duffy B are also homozygous for the promoter silencing variant. In this case, we expect both alleles to be silenced, and we predict that their red blood cells are negative for both Duffy A and Duffy B. 19 of these individuals are also carrying the promoter silencing variant, but in a heterozygous state, so they only have one copy. We would expect that that copy would silence one of the Duffy B alleles, but the other one would be expressed, so our final phenotype prediction is Duffy A negative and Duffy B positive. If we look at the individuals that are heterozygous for Duffy A and Duffy B, we find 14 cases that carry one copy of this promoter silencing mutation. This one is in cis with the Duffy B allele. So we expect that it will silence the expression of Duffy B, but Duffy A will still be expressed. And those red blood cells are predicted to be Duffy A positive, B negative. Remember, the expression in tissues can be different. So we follow the same analysis for all the other blood groups in relation to all the weak and the null alleles that we know for each of them. And this graph is showing you, for example, the relationship between the JKA, JKB antigen typing and the concomitant present of one of the key weakened alleles. So focus on this one, on the participants that are heterozygous for JKA and JKB that also happen to be carrying one copy of this weakening allele. So if we look at the genome, as we said earlier, JKA and JKB is encoded by a single nucleotide variant here in exon 9, SLC14A1 gene. The weakening variant that they are carrying in heterozygous state is encoded here in exon 4. It's a lysine 44 substitution. Because our cohort underwent only exome sequencing, we don't have the sequences for the introns. There's no way for us to know if this weakening variant is on the same side as the JKA or in the chromosome that encodes for JKB. So the only option that we have is to use a computational facing algorithm that are based on the known haplotypes. And so far, this weakening variant has only been documented in cis with JKA. And that corresponds with the fact that we find it very often in JKA homozygous individuals. So given this fact and the output of the computational phasing algorithms, then maybe we can conclude then that the patient is positive for both antigens in the red blood cells, but that the JKA antigen might be weakened serologically. However, we are challenged because we found one individual that clearly has two copies of the same weak variant. In that case, we have one in cis with JKA and one in cis with JKB raising the possibility that the JKB might be weakened and definitely raising the need for us to validate this serologically. 
and the presence of this allele is also confirmed by a JKB homozygous participant that's carrying one of these copies as well. So we are now proceeding with the serologic validation of our predictions from NGS. Uh, so far we've collected 106 samples from these research participants and we've tested them for agglutination with anti-K1, DOFE-A, DOFE-B, JKA, and JKB. So far we have 100% concordance in uh, all five reactions for 103 participants and three discrepancies that I'll show you. The first case, NGS predicted that the patient would be Duffy A negative, Duffy B positive, but serology gave us this opposite result, Duffy A positive B negative. This turned out to be a clerical error by the lab, and the participant was confirmed to be serologically as Duffy A neg, B pos, just like next generation sequencing predicted. In the second case, the participant was predicted to be JKA positive and B positive, but serology told us that the patient was JKA negative. Careful study of the case reveals that NGS detected one of these weak JKA alleles that possibly was not detected by the antibody, however, the antigen is still present. And the third case is just like the second case I discussed. So our future work will be focused on predicting any novel deleterious variants that we identify in blood group genes. We are working on the creation of alternative systems for those areas that have inherent poor mapping qualities, such as some areas of Lutheran actually, or the genes that have rearrangements. And we want to create a public database for next generation sequencing that has an error reporting system. Overall, our long-term vision for a hospital like NIH, where all of our patients are enrolled in research protocols and many of them undergo whole gene or exome NGS, is that this data will not only be used for the patient's treatment or prognosis and diagnosis, but that the blood bank has a mechanism to take the information, extract the red blood cell genotype, and store that in a database. We would couple that with targeted NGS sequencing of our blood donors, and this should allow a more efficient allocation of our available blood products, also increase the efficiency of donor recruitment, and because we're looking at the entire genome, gene sequences, this will allow us to also continue to document and study novel or rare blood group variants. I would like to thank our collaborators, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. That was a really good overview. So as a diehard participant in the platelet community, when do you get the platelets? I have them already. It's just that the talk was focused on red blood cell. The platelet antigens are the easiest. They all map very well. Um, the difficulty is, for example, fucosyl transferases, right? There's many fucosyl transferases in the human genome. Guess what? The alignment sometimes places all of those sequences under fucosyl transferase too. Platelet antigen coding genes are all very unique. They map very well for the most part. There's one deletion. They're all single nucleotide variants, and they've actually all been successfully predicted. We're in the process of doing Sanger resequencing to validate. Excellent work. I was just wondering that uh, where, do you, where do you feel next generation sequencing sort of fits alongside microarrays? Do you feel like they will eventually replace microarray technology, or do you feel like it's a complementary uh, sort of thing where next generation sequencing might be the step above for a certain patient population? I think it depends on the clinical scenario. Are you speaking of microarrays as a SNP typing or microarrays as RNA expression? Uh, SNP typing. A SNP typing. Yeah, I think it depends on the clinical scenario. Um, again, SNP typing is only looking at certain areas that have variation, right? So I did not have time to show this data, but just looking through our cohort and looking, for example, through the thousand genome database, we clearly see that some blood group genes have premature stop codons that we have yet to find. Most of these cases, for us to, for them to be clinical significant, they would have to be present in homozygous state and also in the right clinical scenario. But they are out there. So if we're working with a SNP array that is only targeting the areas that we know are, have variation, we would miss, for example, one of these changes that for our patient might actually mean um, a different transfusion strategy. So this is just more widespread, but it has its caveats. It's open source. I welcome suggestions and coding contributions. Oh, yes. 
I was just wondering, um, why did you use Python? Why did you use C++? Because usually when I see these things are built in C++ due to the speed advantage, and Python does have a little bit of overhead slowdown, um, it, especially if something is, if you're dealing with NGS on this scale, you really want to get as much speed as you can get. That is absolutely true, and we are already running. We are running a thousand at a time, and every time we update the software, we have to run them all again. We only use Python because our lab, that's really the expertise that we have, and we have so many libraries that are already built in Python that we want to take advantage of. Um, and again, we're using non-relational databases because they are flexible. But the thought has always been, once we find um, the optimized, at least an optimized way to interpret this data, then we're going to switch to another system. Uh, in fact, Scala has been brought up for the final uh, version of the software. Thank you. So our next speaker, let's uh, get the slides up. Go. Our next speaker, uh, we have a couple of um, uh, younger speakers. Um, Usama Abbasi, who's a um, student, a PhD student? Yep. PhD student in Jake Kizikidatu's lab. And um, here we go. Coming. Good. Thank you. Pointer. Sure. Before I start, can everyone hear me in the back? Yeah, all right, cool. Alrighty. Hey, folks, my name is Osama Abbasi, and I'm a PhD candidate now at Dr. Kizak, Dr. and Dr. Brooks Lab at Center for Blood Research at UBC. Um, first off, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of my work, thank you, along with your attention and your time. Um, the, one of the projects we've been working on is titled Long Circulating Biodegradable Therapeutic System for Transfusion Iron Overload. <clears throat> the motivation to really focus on transfusion iron overload stems from the fact that this is a direct consequence of transfusion therapy. Now, um, transfusion therapy is used, to, is used for hemoglobin disorder, disorders including thalassemia as well as sickle cell disease, which affect over 300,000 births annually. Transfusion therapy is also used for patients diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, 15,000 patients are diagnosed each year in the U.S. alone. So regular transfusion uh, is the mainstay of care for individuals. Um, and with each transfusion, with each red blood cell transfusion, the patient receives approximately a quarter grams of iron. Now, to put this into perspective, a healthy individual maintains around about three to five grams of iron within their body. Their endothelial system, their retic reticular endothelial system has the capacity to disrupt to 15 grams of iron. Now imagine a beta thalassemia patient who receives anywhere between two to four transfusions per month. Within two years alone, they exceed this capacity. So transfusion iron overload is a, is a limiting factor for the transfusion therapy. Now clinical consequences of iron overload really is oxidative damage. We have uh, mechanisms in place, storage uh, at the level of entrance, storage, metabolism, where really we regulate iron homeostasis. However, once these systems are overloaded, we get the catalytic generation of reactive oxidative species. Now these go on to then elicit damage, uh, not specifically within DNA lipid proteins, and oftentimes many of the deaths in these patients are accounted from uh, organ complications, namely liver, heart, as well as the spleen. Currently, iron overload is treated with iron chelators. These are small molecule drugs that A, primarily bind to iron with high affinity, and B, are readily and rapidly excreted. So indirectly, we introduce an iron excretion pathway where we didn't have one prior to. Now, uh, some of the examples include desferoxamine, discovered back in the 60s and still the current gold standard. Uh, we have defraprone and desferoxamine, which are more recently discovered. And um, there are research out there that's focusing on combination therapy between either or all of them. Now, what's interesting, though, is by nature of being low molecular weight drugs, these are beset by problems. Poor, cir poor circulation time, therefore poor efficiency, severe toxicity, as well as um, poor patient compliance. So our rationale really here is, because it's primarily due to the low molecular weight nature, if we were to increase the effective molecular weight, we'd, in essence, increase the efficiency of iron chelation. And we started our work with HPG, hyperbranched polyglycerol, a biocompatible uh, polymer system with the multiple functional capacity to carry multiple chelating units. So our example here is DFO. It has the capacity to be functionalized with multiple DFOs. 
And what's interesting is we screen the library of HPG DFO both in vitro and in vivo, and um, they are highly biocompatible. In fact, the graph over here demonstrates um, a significantly higher circulation times. DFO in mice, circulation time approximately three to five minutes. One combines HPG DFO with this particular conjugate, it's close to 16 hours. So we're seeing that by increasing the effective molecular weight, we're really increasing the circulation time. To expand on this, we uh, also investigated in iron, loaded, uh, iron overloaded mice, uh, where we also observed significantly, effective, significantly higher excretion of iron um, through these mice models. Now what's interesting is through high molecular weight polymeric approaches, we've diminished the toxicity profiles, we've increased biocompatibility, we've increased circulation time. And with increased circulation time, we begin to observe nonspecific tissue accumulation. So our next step in this direction was really, let's take this polymeric approach, let's introduce a biodegradable element to it. So it's a similar sort of scaffold as HPG with an interesting element introduced. Uh, chemical moieties that are uh, degradable, pH sensitive. And we've got two different types, two different streams of biodegradable polymers. One that follows the DMK no nomenclature. It has a rapid uh, degradability profile, whereas the other one has a slower degradation profile. And our idea here was to really see how can we maximize the efficiency of iron chelation within these mice while maintaining a, um, a reasonable degradation rate. Um, our first round was just to ensure that really using uh, biodegradable polymers, which by their chemical nature are a little more hydrophobic, we need to make sure that they're still biocompatible. Uh, we performed in vitro assays uh, with regards to coagulation, complement activation, replica cells. Here this is just the coagulation um, timing, both APTT and PT. And what's interesting is both at low concentrations, 0.1 mg versus uh, 1 mg per mil, we're seeing relatively uh, biocompatible nature of these polymers. Uh, further, these graphs at the bottom really are showing uh, their reduced toxicity within cell lines in terms of MTS assays. So if we were to have polymer with DFO and if we were to treat the cells at the same DFO concentration, polymeric versions tend to do better within the cells with regards to viability. We expanded this into our in vivo um, and what's, what we're really excited about is the fact that it's working. We have iron excretion, um, so this here is showing iron excretion within the feces, uh, and this here is iron uh, excretion within the urine. And what's of particular interest with no treatment, we're seeing that our polymeric versions, so the, this particular DMK type polymer, is showing an increased excretion of iron through the feces, which is significantly better than DFO alone. On the urine, on the other hand, we're seeing that the GHBK DFO versions are showing a significant increase in iron excretion um, through the urine. And from here, this really is setting up a platform for us to, you know, really figure out the differences in this excretion, because clearly these polymers are showing a preferential uh, excretion pathway, one from the feces, one from the urine. And for us, this is pretty exciting as if we could really tune this and see what advantages this could really pose. Um, with this, I'd like to once again thank the committee here for allowing me to present, giving me the time. If you do have any questions, I have a poster outside, poster number 19. Thank you very much. Did you take a question? We do. Hold on. Incredible work. Um, I'm a little bit fuzzy on things, but if I recall, I think one of the reasons why people consider dual therapy is one of the agents helps shuttle the iron out and then the, the DFO actually um, causes it to be excreted. Are you, have you decided to use this approach to the other types of uh, iron chelators out there? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so for us right now, we're focused on HPG with DFO in particular, and this comes down to the chemistry of it. DFO binds iron in a one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio, right? Uh, whereas the other chelators have either a two-to-one or a three-to-one ratio. And on a polymeric surface, for us, it just ensures success with a one-to-one -one stoic uh, for iron chelation. Once we have this system that's done and working, I think that combination therapy with other chelators would definitely be an avenue to explore. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is Enoli De Silva from uh, a student in uh, Hugh Kim's lab. Enoli, just get your slides up here. So 
So hi, everyone. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at the symposium today. I'll be talking about my project on the role of the actin cytoskeleton on platelet apoptosis, um, which I'm working on under the supervision of Dr. Hugh Kim. So throughout my presentation, I'll be referring to this rough outline, where I'll be first giving you a brief introduction to my project. So my main focus is on platelets, and among the different mechanisms that we know to uh, regulate the lifespan, apoptosis has been shown to be a main contributor. Now, as you know, apoptosis is a program from a cell death that is characterized by caspase activation, which is preceded by mitochondrial depolarization. This is also regulated by the BCL2 pro-survival and pro-apoptotic family of proteins. Now, in my experiments, I'll be using the, or I used, the uh, chemical inducer, ABT737, which is a BH3 mimetic drug. Now, the platelet cytoskeleton is integral to maintaining the platelet structure and shape, and platelets actively remodel their cytoskeleton in response to external stimuli uh, during activation and also during apoptosis. Actin exists in a dynamic equilibrium between its monomeric form and its polymerized filamentous form. And several studies have shown a, a link between actin dynamics and its uh, mitochondrial stability. In specific, reduced actin dynamics have been correlated with reduced cell viability. So, and we have an art at our disposal specific drugs that we can use to destabilize the actin cytoskeleton. And I'll be specifically using latrunculin A and cytoclasin D, which inhibit actin polymerization. So to date, platelet apoptosis signaling mechanism is not very clear. Uh, so we are interested in, to investigate a link between the cytoskeleton and apoptosis uh, to uncover this mechanism in platelets. So I'll be measuring three specific hallmarks in apoptosis uh, listed here uh, using marker-specific dyes by flow cytometry. So now I'd like to show you the results of, for the effect of latrunculin A on platelet apoptosis. Latrunculin A is one of those drugs I showed before, which is known to um, inhibit actin polarization by sequestering actin monomers. So the first marker I followed was mitochondrial depolarization, and this is characterized by the uh, mean fluorescence intensity ratio, PE to FITC ratio, shown on the y-axis. So a decrease in this ratio indicates mitochondrial depolarization. On the x-axis are my treatment conditions. As you can see, platelets are treated with ABT737, have significant mitochondrial depolarization compared to untreated platelets. Uh, again, with uh, just latrunculin A treatment, we see no effect on mitochondrial depolarization. However, and interestingly, when, when platelets were pretreated with latrunculin A prior to ABT737, we see uh, repolarization of the mitochondria compared to with just ABT737. The second marker I followed was caspase activation. So again, that's shown by the FITC mean fluorescence intensity on the y-axis, and again, the same treatment conditions on the x-axis. Again, uh, you can see that when platelets are treated with just ABT737, we have significant increase in caspase activation. No effect seen with just latrunculin A again. Um, however, when we pre-treat with latrunculin A prior to ABT737, we see a reduction in caspase activation. The final hallmark I followed was uh, PS exposure, or phosphatidylserine exposure. Um, so again, that's shown by FITC mean fluorescence intensity. And um, ABT737, again, increased PS exposure. And also, when pre-treating with latrunculin A prior to ABT737, we see a significant reduction in PS exposure. So to summarize my results for latrunculin A, we see that latrunculin A alone did not significantly induce apoptosis markers in platelets, but when you pretreat the platelets with latrunculin A prior to uh, actual inducement using uh, ABT737, we see a reduction in those markers. And I would like to show you the results for uh, cytoclasin D effect on platelet apoptosis. So cytoclasin D also inhibits actin polymerization, but through a different mechanism. So they uh, cap the filament ends and prevent um, binding of monomers. So here I've compiled my data for the two markers, caspase activation and PS exposure. Uh, on the y-axis is sh shown again by the FITC mean fluorescence intensity for both markers. And as you can see with ABT737 treatment, both PS exposure and caspase activation significantly increased. 
Again, with just cytochalasin D treatment, we see no effect on both markers. Uh, however, when we pre-treat with cytochalasin D prior to ABT737 treatment, we have a reduction in PS exposure and caspase activation, which is also what we saw with the latrunculin A data. So to summarize for the second part, uh, cytochalasin D alone also did not significantly induce apoptosis markers, but when you pre-treat with cytochalasin D prior to ABT737, there is a reduction in those markers. So to summarize my results, compiling both the cytochalasin D data and the latrunculin A data, it suggests that the dynamic nature of the actin cytoskeleton may regulate the activity of the BCL2 proteins during platelet apoptosis. And I would like to thank you all and also my supervisor, Dr. Kim, Hugh Kim, and the lab members for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we are right on time. So we will regroup sharp at um, 3.45. All of the posters should be judged during this time. And judges hand in your scores, whatever, to, I'm not sure who, probably to Julian Mira. OK? We'll start sharp, 3.45. Okay, in the final stretch. And Jay is here, so we can start. Perfect. So our next speaker is um, um, James Jim Zimmering, who's a, a, a repeat offender here. We keep getting him back, so we're waiting for the real story, I guess. So Jim grew up in Chicago, but really has lived most of his life, I guess, in, um, in Atlanta at Emory University, where he obtained his BSc in chemistry, a PhD in immunology, his medical degree, then did a postdoc fellowship in cellular immunology, residency in Clune Path um, before he was finally appointed on faculty. Um, and there he really built a, um, a world-class uh, basic science program focusing on immunology of transfused red blood cells and platelets. Um, and he has really gained um, considerable fame in that area. In 2012, he was recruited um, to the Puget Sound Blood Center, otherwise now known, in Seattle, otherwise now known as uh, Bloodworks Northwest where he is now the uh, chief scientific officer. He's also the director of the Transfusion Medicine um, Research uh, Program and a professor at the University of Washington and the Department of Lab Laboratory Medicine. He runs there. He runs an NIH-funded um, laboratory. Um, as, as I've said, is widely recognized for his research contributions, having received several awards in the field. So Jim? Thank you for um, staying. Uh, if you could see Seattle from where you're currently sitting, this is the right angle. Um, you wouldn't see the light because it doesn't come out, but we photoshopped it, so that's good. Uh, my daughter, um, who is, I guess, one of my main companions in life, she's 10, and she asked me where I was going, what I was doing, and I said to her, uh, I'm going to get in a room with a bunch of people that have the same psychopathology I have, and we're going to geek out. So um, I appreciate everyone here in the invitation. I do, I am on the scientific advisory board of Rubius Therapeutics. It's a, a company whose work is unrelated to what I'm going to talk about today. So um, platelets, uh, we've heard some about um, platelet storage today. And the, the state of platelet storage um, is thus, at least um, south of the border and, uh, and similarly here. Uh, I, the metrics of a successful unit of stored platelets are unlinked to the therapeutic rationale for platelet transfusion. That's probably an unnecessarily uh, bleak statement. But um, suffice to say, we don't, you know, we don't measure hemostatic function in vivo. We measure the ability to circulate, and we hope that that, that correlates. But it, it seems um, almost certain that in some instances it doesn't. So our assays are definitely imperfect. And for most platelet storage studies, we look at in vitro things that are logical but not necessarily predictive. 
the storage lesion is a panoply of biological changes, as we've heard about, that occur during platelet storage, just like the red cell storage lesion, and thousands and thousands of things change, some of which may be important, many of which probably aren't, and the trick is to be able to tell the difference if you want those factors to guide your thinking. And at least in the States, on a unit by unit level, not as a, as a process control, but as a product control, um, we have this extremely um, sophisticated cutting edge and uh, excellent uh, sophistication around release criteria. It's highly technical, precise, accurate, and instrumentally complex. And in particular, we do the swirl test um, on units before we send them out the door. Um, you have to be trained for decades to do this properly. It has a very small um, coefficient of variation, et cetera. So um, one of the, uh, this is where we are, and so um, where some may boil bark from trees, we, we shake. And I, I think that it's meaningful to say that as we move forward, we'd like to understand a little bit better um, what's going on in the bag and how it correlates to how the platelets may ultimately circulate. So uh, partnering with Cheryl Schlichter at Bloodworks, who is a, has been a leader in this, this field for a very long time. We got a cohort of human uh, subjects slash volunteers, depending on how you look at it, and we, we took these individuals and we um, uh, apheresed uh, platelets from them uh, and collected apheresis units, and then we stored the units of platelets, and uh, we stored them over eight days of storage, and along the eight days, we took aliquots from the bag uh, and, 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 and froze them down so that we could do metabolomics approach uh, analysis, on them, which I'll describe in a minute. On the fifth day of storage, we took an aliquot from the bag, and like we heard earlier, uh, we labeled it with chromium, and then we infuse it back into the individual and look at how well the platelets circulate. This does not demonstrate hemostatic function, but the thinking is a platelet that doesn't circulate probably isn't doing much after it's no longer circulating. Uh, because there are donor to donor variation, I don't know who, who brought it up, but um, someone did as far as the recipient's ability to clear stored platelets. In platelet studies, we typically take fresh platelets on the day of the study and we label them with a separate radioisotope, in this case, indium, and then we infuse them together, and you measure the survival of the stored platelets with one radioisotope uh, compared to the, the fresh platelets with the other radioisotope. And the idea here um, is to normalize volunteer-to-volunteer um, -volunteer variation as far as their spleen, reticular endothelial system, et cetera. But there's advantages and disadvantages to that kind of thinking. So what we get from studies such as these are 24-hour recoveries and then longer-term platelet survivals. And um, what we were trying to do in this study I'm going to describe to you is sift through the metabolic changes that happen during platelet storage and find those that at least correlate with the, the circulation of the platelets, thereby kind of narrowing the field to things that might be worth uh, additional analysis. Now, um, as, uh, as Dana taught me, the, sometimes the devil's in the details math-wise, because consider this. If I was storing platelets and um, there was a 9% recovery, right, which would be poor, uh, but the fresh platelets had a 10% recovery, which would also be poor, bad 9 is not that much worse than bad 10. And so this individual would have a 90% platelet recovery, Whereas someone else who had a 50% recovery and their fresh platelets were 100 would have a poor paltry 50%. So we have to be very mindful that we do these things for good reasons, but it doesn't necessarily follow that this was due to the recipient's spleen. The recipient's platelets may just be, be different, they would say in Seattle. They may just be different. So um, we have to keep this in mind as we analyze the data. Right, so the hypothesis is of the, of the multiple variables that change during storage, a subset of metabolites will correlate with and are potentially causally involved in how they circulate. And I should tell you that metabolites and proteomics, glycomics, et cetera, um, you know, most of these studies have been carried out looking at stored units of red cells or platelets just at the unit with no correlation to what happens then. And so it's, it, it, in the beginning of this field, it's really just made things categorically worse, and it's, it's been my honor to be involved in that process. Uh, because instead of having eight things where we didn't know what they meant, we now have 4,000 things, and we don't know what they mean. But look how much we've observed that we don't know what it means, and so that's a good starting point. So to give you a description of our cohort, this is what it looked like. There were 21 volunteers. Um, 
this look better when I put the slide together. Sorry for the shift. This is a, this is a Microsoft Apple problem. And, and basically, we had a range of, of storage, uh, as you might imagine. We measured the MPV and the pH, et cetera. And just to instantiate what I was talking about before, um, these two separate donors, uh, how their recoveries look, uh, you have to look at it uh, as, as the corrected value may not reflect the absolute circulating value. Okay. The era of moromics. So um, this is basically a, a microscope was the Louis Pasteur. With advanced um, informatics and mass spec capabilities, we can now observe multiple analytes simultaneously in multiple specimens. And I'll tell you, and this goes to speak, uh, and again, you can tell I have a somewhat sardonic sense of humor, but as Steve was talking earlier about how some donors have led in them <laughs> The mass spec is agnostic to chemicals. So I can tell you as a matter of fact, at least, if you're admitted to Harborview Hospital in Seattle and you receive a transfusion and you feel better, it might be because you're oxygenating your tissues more or it might be because the donor unit was chock full of cocaine. <laughs> we find this. So, you know, there's some questions we don't ask our donors or we don't know. So there's a lot of stuff in there and I'm just going to talk about some of it, but not that. But it's something to keep in mind. So principal component analysis is a statistical maneuver one can do to see which compounds or family of compounds in the unit are most driving the changes. And it's, it's pretty and one does it and, and the answer is, yeah, things change. And so I, I have to show it. It's a compulsory with this type of talk. But basically, I'm going to just, because of the interest of time, ask you to accept the claim um, that the type of general metabolic trends we saw were consistent with uh, two, two previous reports that have looked at metabolic changes in stored platelets not linked to infusions. To my knowledge, this, is the, this was the first study that linked it to infusions. And um, because it, um, you get a lot of stuff that comes out of this, if you look at recovery, right, so this is the first 24 hours after transfusion, you can cluster um, the, the types of compounds that had a negative correlation or a positive correlation. This was very appealing to me. It basically lines up with my psychology and approach to life. There's a lot more negative here than positive. And a lot of things uh, started to correlate with poor recoveries, although there were some that came out positive. And I'll focus in on a few of the main players um, later. Alternatively, when you look at survival, this is after 24 hours, how well the platelets continue to do, probably more applicable to patients with neoplasia as opposed to um, acute trauma. Uh, there, the negative um, correlations clustered around fatty acid metabolism and lipid peroxidation, and it did so very strongly. Now, before we talk about that, let me talk about this, is that um, this is a, a picture of uh, Fisher and Pearson, that when you um, observe lots and lots of things and look for trends, it's problematic, and it's problematic in a way that statisticians can't yet really handle, and it's a multiple observation effect. Um, this has caused problems throughout the world. There's a, a book that I'm, I'm very angry at still that came out several years ago called The Bible Code, where if you look at every combination of letters in, in the Torah in every different direction and, and ignore all the combinations that don't mean anything, a few combinations will come out that are kind of spooky, like Yahweh's great or stuff like that. And you can, you can find the hidden code. And as, as a demonstration of how, how problematic this is and how ridiculous it is if you look at enough things, which, by the way, we do in with omics platforms. There's a great book I recommend highly called Spurious Correlations by, by Tyler Viggen, which demonstrates this. And so he, he analyzed every possible combination of things. And you'll notice that over time, there's a spooky correlation between the age of Miss America and murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. This necessitates explanation. Um, the first submission of our grant on this topic did poorly, but I'm optimistic because we were able to build in the divorce rate in Maine per capita consumption of margarine. <laughs> Likewise, the worldwide non-commercial space launches with sociology doctorates awarded in the United States, at least, American-centric view, apologies. And finally, the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets as a function of the total revenue generated by skiing facilities, again, <laughs> in the United States of America. You find these things everywhere, as an example. Um, Dr. Devine, who has some interest, I believe, in the genetic basis of blood storage. Dana Devine is an anagram for adenine DNA, okay? <laughs> How can you explain this conspiracy? These spooky coincidences must be based in some underlying mechanism. So, having said that, let me say this. 
that when we look at uh, the various metabolites that come out and correlate very strongly, instead of doing a p-value analysis, right, because with a p-value of 0 0.05, by chance alone, if you're looking at 200 things, you know, 10, et cetera, so one out of 20 is going to be positive, the p-value ceases to be meaningful. You can do q-value analysis, which basically looks at the distribution of the p-values and tells you whether or not this would emerge even if there was nothing there. But the statistics theory there presupposes you know how related every variable is to the other variable, and we don't know because we don't understand the full metabolome yet. That having been said, you can do false determination rate analysis on this, and I'll just I'll have to ask you to believe or not believe me as you will, is that, that some of these are going to be type 1 errors, but not all of them. And so our future studies have to kind of narrow the field, but this is the playing field, lipid oxidation on platelet survival, and these lipid oxidants come from multiple metabolic pathways, largely around arachidonic acid or linoleic acid, which are released from the SN2 position when phospholipase acts on glycerol phospholipids as part of metabolism. Okay. Time is limited, so before um, I kind of close, I want to just say, and this is hoping that when I get back into the States they don't get angry because Seattle's very particular, is that caffeine emerged and many metabolites of caffeine emerged as having a negative correlation to the platelet storage. Seattle, very caffeinated city. With this assay, we can detect caffeine metabolites in the water from Puget Sound. I don't know if this reflects some advanced marketing strategy with salmon or it's just that all the, you know, the pee goes, whatever. It's not important. Be that as it may, there are evil forces at play who are trying to suppress these findings, and I will just leave it at that. Um, these are changes that accumulate over time in all units, by the way. It's not as though some have it and some don't but it's, they diverge with the circulation of the platelets after the fact. And here's an example because people always like to see the distribution. For example, um, the meristyl carnitine, you can see the negative correlation on the right. It's, it's, it's highly significant, but one always worries with a sample size of only 21, which is you know, difficult sometimes in humans, how strong the trend will be, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to, to ferret this out over time. I should point out, in deference to my gracious hosts that whereas we're looking at the metabolome, um, uh, researchers here, who's, so is this showing, no. So Dana, I, I pinched a paper of yours, and here's the slide to give you credit, but miraculously, it's blank, thanks. But there, there, are, there are peptide signatures which have similar trends, and then the trick is to try to, and Peter, work, try to link the peptides and the, the, the enzymatic pathways to the metabolic pathways and get a gestalt, et cetera. Now, finally, um, Jose was talking earlier about mouse plate storage. Um, these are, this is a bag of mouse platelets. Mouse platelets are more similar to human platelets than mice are to humans. And we have to use a, a GFP trick to track the platelets so we can follow them around. And the blue line is the post-transfusion survival of mouse platelets. The red is 24 hours, so blue is fresh, and then and green is 48 hours. And then when we do the metabolic profile, um, when you look at a function of fresh of stored, most, not all, most of the same metabolites oxidatively with lipids accumulate in mouse red cell storage compared to humans. So I am relieved after all this work that the discovery phase uh, studies in humans were predictive of the mouse species and we can now advance understanding mouse health, which is our primary goal. So that having been said, I, I, the number of people who contributed to this work are many, a lot of very uh, happy collaborators around uh, the country, North America, including here, but I should acknowledge the main drivers in Seattle who did this work, and as a warning to you, in case your legislature should be so foolish as to continue forward on their current trend, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Since my psychopathology might be close to as advanced as yours, <laughs> I'm just curious, is there a serious message you could ruin the tenor of your talk by telling us? Wow. <clears throat> 
And this is like when I compliment my wife's shoes and she says, what, so my, my shirt's ugly? I, uh, <laughs> I won't go to the double negative here. Yeah, I think so. There's several. I know time is short. I apologize. The, the message here is that there's, there's three. One is that um, the metabolites that correlate with survival and those that correlate with recovery are not the same. All right, so, so donor variation can be an advantage as much as a detriment. If it's true that some platelets are, are more active in the short term and some in the longer, you'd want the platelets more active in the short term to be in your trauma patients and the longer in your bone marrow failure or, or neoplasia patients. And so there's a donor management issue here. More importantly, if we can understand which components of the storage lesion are functionally important, then that's where we should be targeting our development of storage technologies and donor management. And so this is a platform to separate the wheat from the chaff because most of the storage studies are not done linked to circulation. So the phenotype linkage is critical, except I'm not confident the phenotype linkage demonstrates hemostatic function, which is a problem we all deal with. So the serious mention is some, some virtues, many inadequacies, and, and that's where I think that the field has to go moving forward. Some, something that would block or reduce lipid oxidation based on what you showed? A absolutely, with one caveat, is that increasing platelet circulation and rendering them unable to participate in, in, in coagulation would be a poor choice. We all know that platelets have this capacity, right? If you look at um, platelets from patients that have been in ECMO, if you look at uh, urinary platelet syndrome, you can have platelets that circulate great and do very little. And with all respect for, for platelet storage technologies on transfusion, for which I have much, we know that when patients have a 50% bleed rate and you transfuse them really well, you get it down to 35 or 40%. Okay, that's a good thing, but that's not nothing. And it, and, and it could be that the, you're missing other stuff, as, as Cheryl would argue, or it could be that the playlists just aren't doing that much except circulating. And so I think we need, we need to, to tie those types of analyses. And, and that, that's happening. You can see in the field these sorts of trends are emerging, especially around how pathogen reduction platelets have been validated. But non-inferiority is different than making them better. Any other comments slash questions? Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay, thank you. Okay, last but not least, from our own UBC. I'm just set you up for a second, Marco. So Dr. Um, Marco Mera um, received his Master of Science and PhD in Genetics at Simon Fraser University, and then went to St. Louis where he gained expertise at, um, at the Genome Sequencing Center, returning to um, BC's uh, BC Cancer Agency to head the mapping and sequencing a Genome Sequence Center. Um, he rapidly gained international recognition, studying the interplay between the cancer genome and the epigenome, with particular focus on the evolution of treatment-resistant cancers. Um, he has spent much of his career working within and leading teams uh, seeking to study fundamental problems in a cancer genome bio biology. He is currently professor and head of medical genetics at UBC and the UBC Canada, Re uh, Re Canada, UBC Canada Research Chair in Genome Science. Uh, Marco is also the director of the Genome Sciences Center at BC Cancer Agency and a member of the Order of British Columbia. He has won numerous awards, uh, well, well known, and he's welcome. Marco, you're on. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ed and, and Dana and Mira out there who uh, put up with trying to organize me. Uh, I gather it's difficult. Um, so this is a talk about cancer. Uh, and it's uh, a talk mostly about solid cancer, I suppose, or solid cancers, I should say. Um, what we, we really want to do, though, is talk about our, our struggles to evolve uh, a pipeline that is uh, both patient and clinically oriented, in which we attempt uh, at scale to generate uh, genome information and use it to inform treatment planning. Now, when I was uh, showing my slides to my, uh, my 
hypercritical graduate students, and all you graduate students know that it's easy to criticize your advisors. Uh, one of the bioinformaticians said, well, you know, this business of whole genome blah, blah, blah is exceedingly boring. Uh, and so uh, this was uh, her suggestion uh, as a way to kind of liven it up and make it topical. I, I wouldn't actually want to defend this statement because I don't think that uh, we're quite yet in the era of what I think truly big data are. Um, I, I think there's a lot of organizations that do struggle in that space, uh, but, I, but I think that if this kind of activity is to continue, uh, we really are going to be uh, uh, in the era of big data. So I, I want to start with um, uh, a vision uh, slide. So this is not uh, complicated. Uh, <laughs> it's not even complete. But the, the concept is if the, we can integrate data across a variety of different domains, we ought to be able to achieve better cancer control. So that's the vision, that's the thesis. And where we come into this is on the bottom there, uh, this genome data piece. So there are uh, all manner of clinical data that either are collected or ought to be collected. Uh, and we would like to imagine a, a future in which uh, now, in addition to those other types of data, we have genome data. And I would go so far as to say that genome data alone uh, is not uh, what we would seek uh, to, to produce, ultimately, but rather this business of integration. But in order to do this, uh, genome science is going to have to change, and the clinic is going to have to change. Uh, and whether or not there's appetite uh, to facilitate all the changes required, I don't know, but, but I am encouraged by where we are with this personalized oncogenomics thing. Uh, so what, what is this, uh, this thing that I'm talking about or alluding to? So it's both a, a project uh, and it's become a platform. Uh, and so the, the project uh, really was to try and use whole genome information as well as uh, the sequences of, of all the RNA molecules, integrate those data and find genetic anomalies which would both inform on the molecular uh, nature of, of the disease uh, as well as uh, inform treatment planning uh, for patients. And so uh, that resulted in the establishment of a pipeline, which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, but what it also uh, did was, was establish a paradigm by which uh, individuals with uh, particular cancer cohorts that they might be interested in could interact with the Genome Sciences Center, which, as Ed said, I'm the director of. And so a great many projects, both locally and nationally and, and now internationally, have borrowed on the pipeline, a uh, picture of which I will show you. Um, and, and in case I lose you all, uh, I, I think this is where we're at uh, in this POG project. I think, um, you know, we want to contribute fundamental information. We want to be able to move the needle on outcomes for cancer patients. What have we done? I think we've, we've established within the context of, of BC Cancer, which is an organization that I will also describe, uh, a feasibility assessment. Uh, now over the course of about a thousand uh, patients uh, uh, analyzed. Uh, so we would say that the major elements of the infrastructure, including uh, the, the vital nature that computational uh, biology and computer science plays, these things have, have been implemented after a fashion. Uh, we have gained the trust of the Research Ethics Board at BC Cancer uh, and, and clinicians, uh, interventional radiologists, pathologists, the whole scope of activities that uh, you would like to have to support this kind of thing. And we've begun a fairly intensive program now, uh, six and a half years old, of uh, training uh, primarily medical oncologists and pathologists to interpret genome data. Uh, and so uh, what we're presenting here now is, is really the end point of the establishment of the infrastructure and fond hopes uh, for perhaps uh, scaling it all up. But before we talk about uh, the pipeline, we should talk a little bit about cancer. Um, and so this is a, a slide borrowed from uh, the Canadian Cancer Society Statistics Handbook. They publish this every year. And, and there's endless statistics. We won't dwell on them except to point out um, that in Canada, uh, cancer is the leading cause of mortality. 
uh, both the incidence and the prevalence of cancer is increasing, and this is largely attributed to, to aging populations, that uh, the annual cost of, of cancer control in Canada is on the order of $4 billion. This is an estimate made by a health economist that's attached to, to the project. And of that $4 billion, uh, drugs account for about 50%. And these, this, these are direct cost estimates. Uh, in the States, it's more, as, as you could imagine. Uh, so that's the landscape in which we work. And over the time that I've been at, uh, at BC Cancer, which is now almost 20 years, uh, a great fear has emerged. And that fear is that it's going to be very, very difficult to, for us, uh, as cancer control people, to um, continue to offer the same standard of care, maintain our position in the world, due to the increasing costs of management. Uh, and so a, a close colleague of mine who's just retired, a fellow named Joe Connors, he's a lymphoma doc, he said, well, you know, I used to have the opportunity to cure people for maybe 5,000 bucks. And now I have the opportunity to cure those same people for $150,000. And where does it end? And so he's now reflecting on the very high cost of, of agents that are known as immune checkpoint inhibitors. Who's heard of immune checkpoint inhibitors? Okay, a few people have, and we can talk about what those things are. But uh, average costs of the immune checkpoint inhibitors in BC uh, per patient is on the order of $63,000 per course of therapy. Uh, patients can be on these things for a year or more. Um, and so this is the landscape where um, we're, we're thinking that we need to come up with better ways to steward the resources that we have in order to continue to offer uh, the best care. And so genomics is being asked to solve this problem. How can we use genome science to more efficiently manage uh, the resource base? And I don't think this project has the answer to that, but that is the problem, or at least one of them. So in BC, uh, cancer is managed by BC Cancer, uh, which has a provincial mandate uh, for cancer control in the province and has the primary jobs of uh, dispensing uh, uh, radiation and chemotherapy and establishing best practices through uh, these structures called tumor groups, which are collections of, of expert uh, doctors who come together to establish what treatment paradigms BC should adopt. Uh, there are six large uh, so-called regional cancer centers, uh, one here in, in Vancouver, another in Victoria, Prince George, Fraser Valley, so on and so forth around 3,000 employees, uh, a budget approaching, an annual budget approaching about three quarters of a billion dollars now, 103 uh, medical oncologists uh, in the province managing uh, uh, a caseload that looks something like 25,000 new diagnoses per year now, uh, expanding uh, considerably over the next little while, again, primarily driven by the aging population. So that's the context in which the Genome Sciences Center was launched. Uh, in 1999, and that's the context in which we've been uh, doing uh, most of this work. So we have not uh, imagined spreading beyond the, the boundaries of the province at this particular point in time because we think we, we have a great deal to learn within uh, these boundaries. But in the background, uh, genome science has been, has been marching on, and, uh, and this has been alluded to now in several talks, uh, more omics as we've just heard, and, and Selena uh, made some references to this. Uh, the last time, I, you know, I looked, uh, I could find a piece of paper that said there were a couple hundred thousand whole genome sequences since uh, we published the draft uh, sequences of the human genome in 2001. And of course, this has been driven uh, almost entirely by technological uh, developments leading to, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine logs of uh, increased uh, efficiency. So people have been, you know, that's the hammer, and so people are wa doing whack-a-mole with the hammer and, and trying to point this thing uh, at various problems, and cancer uh, has done the same. Uh, and so uh, there are now very large compendia of genome data from uh, all manner of different cancers. The International Cancer Genome Consortium, or ICGC, uh, which has a secretariat in Toronto, uh, is, a, is a sort of project organizing entity with participants from all around the world, including the Cancer Genome Atlas Project uh, run out of uh, the States. And, and you can see uh, with that very beautiful pie thing, 
um, that as of December 17, 2017, which is the last time the databases were updated, 76 cancer projects, 21 primary sites, 17,000 donors with molecular data, um, on the order of uh, 68, 68 million, I should say, simple somatic mutations. So these are the, 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 the simple spelling mistakes, A, G, T, C, those kinds of things, and so on and so forth. So when you look across the space of publicly available data, um, the very heavy emphasis has been on primary untreated malignancies. And so we now think we have a reasonable uh, catalog of all the broken pieces in many cancers, not all cancers, uh, and we certainly wouldn't claim that we know all the broken pieces, but through these catalogs, which are generally available, we, we have a fairly detailed molecular glimpse. There's patient information associated with many of these studies that we can also draw down. But we don't uh, have the same detail for uh, metastatic cancers, uh, and that's a big problem. Uh, you know, 10,000 uh, new uh, diagnoses in BC, uh, between a half and a third, really, of all diagnoses present with metastatic disease, and I'm told by my clinician colleagues uh, that the only common adult uh, malignancy that's routinely curable in the metastatic setting is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, at which achieves a 60% cure rate in our jurisdiction with standard of care. So there's lots of work to be done. Uh, it, it remains to be done. But we've learned some stuff, and so one of the things we've learned uh, is that cancers are incredibly heterogeneous at the genetic And so this slide tries to make that point. Uh, there's uh, genes here, and there's patients here. Oh, sorry, I'm terrible with the mouse, aren't I? The, the patients uh, are on the bottom. And the way you read this is you start at the bottom with the patients and you read up. And so what you can see is that this yellow guy here, which is a follicular lymphoma patient, has a mutation in that gene and a mutation in that gene, but not there. One there, 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 and there. So that's great. So this is not all of them. This, these are the major driver alterations. If you go next door, also a follicular lymphoma patient, that patient does not have a mutation in that gene, does not have a mutation in that gene, but does have a mutation there, and so on and so forth. Across the top are genes which are frequently mutated in disease, and there are several of those. So we can say with some certainty at this particular point that if you're a follicular lymphoma patient, you have a 90% chance of having um, uh, BCL2 IGH. Uh, you have a 90% chance of loss of function alterations in KMT2D. And so we can tell you what your probability of having both of those things are. We seem to assort basically independently. But we cannot tell you what other driver alterations you have. And you can't predict this from the data that exists, or at least we can't. We've tried. And that's just the simple uh, spelling mistakes in the genetic code, these you know, things in the, the box there, the G to A's. But there are many other alterations. So there are copy number alterations. You know, There's that green bit of, of DNA that's downshifted. So those are copy number losses. We see those. We see structural alterations, translocations, inversions, all manner of weird things. Uh, we see modulations of gene expression, and now we have the epigenome that we have to worry about, too. So all of this is happening in these genomes, not just the simple spelling mistakes. So the, the, the need has emerged uh, to try and wrap our heads around this, both from the clinical perspective as well as the research perspective. Uh, clinically, most jurisdictions now offer these things called panels. And what these panels are, are collections of uh, assays for genes uh, or for specific mutations that seem to be particularly actionable and maybe relevant in the clinic. And at BC Cancer, uh, we've designed and now are offering through the Genome Center uh, some panel sequences uh, or sequencing um, uh, technologies. We do this, we call one the Onco panel. It's a bunch of cancer genes. There's the myeloid panel, which is rather more focused. There's the hereditary cancer panel and so on and so forth. This is relatively recent in our jurisdiction. It was September 2016 in the inset box that you see there where uh, this was initially rolled out. And whether it actually makes a difference in survival or not, we still don't know, but we do it uh, because that's now considered the standard of care. But what I can tell you is that in almost every single case where we've been able to compare a panel result with a whole genome result, uh, we are filled with what we are fairly certain are false negatives in the panels in genes that we didn't sample. 
So we would see the job as research now to go into that space and try and, and point out the utility of, of having all of that information. And that's really what POG is, is trying to do. Uh, I'll just make one point from this. Uh, so across the top is a trajectory of investment made over time in building infrastructure at the Genome Sciences Center, and I, I use this to acknowledge uh, both the National Cancer Institute in the United States, which has supported us over the years, and also acknowledge the Canada Foundation for Innovation, uh, which has entertained uh, numerous applications from us and continues to support us most recently with a $28 million uh, award that we have now uh, used to upgrade our facilities. Uh, and I would point out that when we started this whole enterprise, you know, almost two decades ago, if I had $10 to spend, I'd spend eight of it on the wet lab side of things and two of it on the dry lab side of things, and now that equation is pretty much flipped. So, so it's not the ability to, to generate sequence that matters anymore. It's the ability to try and uh, use the data in some productive way to appreciate what it might mean. Uh, another way to think about uh, uh, how POG superimposes on our history of scale up, the first case was published uh, in Genome Biology in, in 2010. Uh, and that was at a time when the accumulation of DNA sequence was almost not even on scale. And so you see over the course of time uh, how our ability to do more and more and more has scaled with the technology. So we're at about 1,000 cases enrolled at this particular point in time. And over the course of this, we've evolved the pipeline. This is our pipeline. Uh, and this pipeline uh, is, um, I guess, designed uh, with and by and for uh, medical oncologists and pathologists and genome sciences uh, working together. Um, the key points here are, that, I, that I'll emphasize here are we're sequencing uh, tumor genomes at 80-fold uh, average redundancy, uh, normal genomes, uh, and, and that's the only place where blood will come in in this talk because primarily what we're doing is sequencing the normal, you know, the peripheral blood is a surrogate for normal DNA, and we're sequencing RNA. We're now able to produce uh, a targeted alignment uh, report in about 17 uh, days, and this is essentially automated. You could think of this as a, as a super panel, if you like. So it's a first look at the genome, it's essentially automated, and in 17 days we can generate um, about 430 uh, billion bits of information uh, for a particular case. But it's not until much later, 55 days, that we have a fully uh, complete and bespoke analysis that reveals uh, things that we might not have guessed we would find through the, the panel type analysis. And so that's too long uh, and needs, uh, needs much refinement. Um, the other key bits here are the formation of something called a tumor board. So every Thursday at 2 o'clock for six years uh, we meet uh, pathologists, oncologists, scientists, and we discuss cases. And we do between four and six cases. Uh, at that meeting. Now, that's not all the cases we process, but those are the ones that we have time to discuss. And that continues to be an important framework um, for trying to decide whether any of the genome information might in some way be relevant to informed treatment planning. Uh, the other key point that I'm going to make is that it's a lot more than simple A's, G's, T's, and C's. And so when we do these kinds of interactions with the oncology community, the lead doc, my colleague Janessa Laskin, she'll turn around and she'll ask uh, uh, the physician who's managing the care of the patient whose case was just presented, did you think that was informative? And did you think uh, that was actionable? And because nobody of the 83 medical oncologists that are enrolling patients, they really can't agree on what these terms mean. We feel we have to ask them individually. And you get a picture that looks something like this. So every time you see a black tick, it means that that data bit was relevant in informing treatment planning for patients. So there's two things to take away. There's a lot of black bits, um, and almost, most of them are in the expression space and in the mutational space. So we're using the gene expression to infer pathways and pathway activation to supplement the A's, G's, T's, and C's. And that becomes very important uh, because what we're doing is we're not saying there is a mutation in a gene and that means something. We're saying there's a mutation in a gene. The gene is known to interact in a pathway. Positive regulators of that pathway 
uh, may have signals that indicate they're activated. Negative regulators of that pathway may be inactivated. And so we try and integrate that information and we produce a picture that looks like this. And I'm not going to take you through it, other than all the colors and all the genes mean something and superimposed on this are little thermometers here uh, which have to do with gene expression compared against all known data uh, that is out there that we've managed to hoover down. So this is what we talk about when we talk about a case now. And after six years, the medical oncologists in the community understand what this means. And they can use this uh, to query us. Uh, they can use it uh, after a fashion to direct uh, or to inform patient care. So, so that is what comes out of all of these boxes and things. Um, and so there's our target alignment report over here. That's the thing that comes out in 17 days. And here's the other thing that comes out in 55 days. Knowledge base is how we store our data. And so that's data that we build from analysis of the patient. And it's also data that comes from uh, papers that we read and, and from the clinical system. So how do we read papers at a rate? I mean, if you, if you go into the literature and you type in immune checkpoint inhibitors, in PubMed, you're going to get thousands of references. So how do you read that? And we've decided, well, actually, at this particular point, we can't read it. Uh, and so this has started a new pilot, and I have no data to show you, but I'm simply saying that we're using now uh, text processing tools to try and identify the papers that we ought to read and rank them in some kind of a hierarchy, which hopefully will be useful. So this is the work of a graduate student, Jake Lever, working with our head of informatics, uh, Steve Jones, and uses machine learning models. Uh, to, to help identify uh, both gene names and relationships between genes and drugs. On the drug angle, uh, we're now hoovering into the, the knowledge base uh, information about drug utilization, information about durations on therapy. The, the outcome data we've discovered is probably not all that good across all of the malignancies that we would like it to be. Uh, and so that's informed the clinic now. If we want to use genome science, we have to have uh, better outcome uh, information. So all of this now uh, represents something like this. So these are the data that we have available to us, something uh, on the order of 10 billion rows of information in knowledge base. And this has been shared now with two other entities, one Civic DB, which is uh, being uh, generated uh, at WashU by OB and Malachi Griffith, former graduate students with us at the Genome Center, the now uh, Assistant Directors of Informatics at the WashU Genome Center and, and other entities as well. And they're reciprocating. And so we're getting to the point now where we think, uh, at least for some patients, uh, we're, we're able to achieve this, this mission. Okay. Um, so we got the attention of David Suzuki in the Nature of Things about uh, a year and a half, two years ago, and, and they produced this uh, episode called Cracking Cancer. And I, and I thought, you know, this sounds like a bunch of data and a bunch of wonderful things, and it is a bunch of anecdotes at this particular point in time. That's what it is, anecdotes. But I wanted to share one with you because this is the kind of thing that, that uh, we would aspire to uh, ultimately in the long run. And if we get sound out of this, you can, you can hear this story. Zuri Scrivens is patient number 10 in a bold experiment to stop cancer. You know, the whole thing for me has been a roller coaster. I had a baby, and there was so much joy. And then 10 months later, I had breast cancer, and everything changed. At 33, Zuri had a mastectomy, followed by standard breast cancer treatments. Nine months later, her cancer was back. It had spread to her liver and lymph nodes. Stage four, incurable cancer. You know, when someone tells you that it's spread, your head goes to the worst place possible. Um, and I really thought that was it for me. Then, Zuri was prescribed a medication commonly used for diabetes, and her cancer disappeared. <laughs> that was over three years ago. That's it? Surreal. <laughs> Not even real <laughs> at all. Um, it still shocks me, even though I've had three scans over the course of two and a half years. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. You get the idea. Uh, and so Zuri has emerged as a strong proponent of this, of course, and she's given me permission to share her story, which is why I'm doing this. 
you know, I could tell you about a blood pressure pill uh, that seems to have had very dramatic effects on metastatic colorectal cancer. I can tell you about a patient who failed on very expensive immunotherapy only to have the genome reveal a deficiency and an enzyme that catabolizes uh, 5-FU and had an amazing response to 5-FU treatment. I, had I mean, there's, there's dozens of these anecdotes. What's important about these anecdotes is uh, they feed back uh, into the data structure. Uh, and so we learn when we do these things. We discovered a fusion uh, in a gene called NRG1, and we saw that originally in a lung cancer. And we knew that NRG1 fusions from research in the literature acted through the ERB-B family of receptors and activated downstream uh, kinase pathways. Uh, and so this led us to hypothesize a blockade of the ERB-B family of receptors with the dirty tyrosine kinase inhibitor would be in fact valuable, and it was. Uh, and 100 patients later, here's another NRG1 fusion with many of the same characteristics, a different fusion partner in the genome. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, the integration of the data suggested that the ERB-B family receptors was uh, the transduction mechanism, activation of downstream signaling pathways. And once again, uh, afatinib, which was the name of the drug, was, was suggested, and, and that was done. Uh, and that was an almost automatic uh, uh, thing because it was read into the database and once again it had a very profound effect on malignancy. Uh, sometimes what we generate is more profoundly influences things in other jurisdictions. So uh, MSKCC in New York uh, has incorporated energy one fusions uh, onto their clinical panel and we have yet to do that locally. But anyway, somebody sees value, it's good. Uh, I'll just uh, thank Janessa, who's a medical oncologist, co-leader of the POG program. Steve is the head of bioinformatics. Howie's a medical oncologist, works on GI cancers. Uh, Intan Schroeder is a, a medical geneticist, practices at the Cancer Agency. Dan Renuff is head of the Phase I Clinical Trials Unit. Dean Regeer is a health economist. Stephen Yip uh, is a pathologist. And Robin Roscoe provides overall management, and they are part of a, a much larger team. And this is really the team. This is an institutional effort, I guess you could say, to try and explore how this all works. Um, many thanks to all. And I think I, I uh, want to particularly acknowledge BC Cancer. The foundation has enabled much of this. And of course, I've already talked about the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Uh, and just to impress upon you that we, we are trying to understand the characteristics of our cohort, I'm, I'm just going to leave this up. This is the, the provocative slide, which uh, presents many lessons learned up to this point and many opportunities for improvement. So we look forward to making some of those as we move forward with this vision of whole genome and transcriptome analysis to inform cancer treatment planning. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Um, so I have a question about uh, potential directions for expanding the POG program. You mentioned it early, and you seemed a little disdainful of, uh, or at least disdainful of the price point associated with certain immunotherapies. Hmm. But one thing is they do offer a very interesting branch for potential cancer solutions. As an immunologist myself, I was wondering if there are any ideas to expand the POG, pro the POG program to actually looking at the microenvironment of the tumor, <laughs> and I see you're smiling there. <laughs> um, feasibility aside, I think it would be very interesting. I'm wondering if there are any ideas or dreams <laughs> yeah. at this point to do that. Well, okay, so that, that's an excellent question because it aligns directly with our own thinking on the topic, so thank you for reaffirming the, the value of our, our own internal thoughts. So I hope I didn't sound disdainful. I was just making the point that they're expansive. And in many respects, they're applied, at least in our jurisdiction, without uh, biomarker evidence. So they're getting chucked at people. Uh, and so we're not quite sure what the expectation from a health economics point of view is going to be if we start chucking you know, $100,000 therapies at people without having some appreciation for what we're doing. So if you look in the literature, there are literally hundreds of trials going on right now with immune checkpoint inhibitors in combination with other things. It's just the most amazing space ever. 
Um, and so there's a lot of interest. Uh, and, and the answer to your question is, yes, we've thought very hard about this. And so when, when we look at the costs of immune checkpoint inhibitors over the duration uh, of uh, application within a patient, and we look at the costs of what we're doing, because this is very expensive, um, if, if we make some assumptions about the early outcome data that we're seeing, uh, and uh, we acknowledge that about 60%, 60 to 70% of patients that get checkpoint uh, inhibitors don't show any benefit at all, and some of them show some amazing toxicities. I mean, you can give people diabetes with these things, among other things, right? I mean, they're terrible things. Uh, when you factor all that in, and the fact that, that good biomarkers don't exist to direct therapy, uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors are one context where we think we could be making an argument to the Ministry of Health probably within a year or so on the cost, the sustainable cost efficacy of using this kind of thing uh, to align patients to checkpoint. And for pay people that shouldn't get checkpoint, and people with B2M alterations or what have you, that putting them on, on some other uh, more rational choice of therapy. So it's actually, um, in, our, in our view, uh, exactly the direction where we think we might be making an argument, a health economics argument, uh, to the ministry, never mind a, a, you know, a scientific and medical one. So, it's next. so this business of checkpoint, you know, not many people had heard of it. It's, it's kind of uh, important. So, so um, there are systems in your body that prevent your immune system from attacking you. Uh, and a relatively recent discovery was that uh, tumor cells could express some of these little flags on their cell surface which said, uh, hey, I'm not a foreign entity, I'm a you, and you should leave me alone, and so the cancer cell proliferates. Uh, what's been shown is, is that if you inhibit uh, the action of that little flag that the cancer cell has learned uh, uh, to wave, that identifies it as self, if you, if you can mask that effect, and expose uh, tumors to the action of the immune system, you can have very, very, very profound uh, results when you apply these inhibitors. I mean, there's, there's some terrible toxicities, but there's also some amazing uh, and durable responses, some of which now are verging on, on you know, even cures, if, if we can still use that word in the field. So it's a very powerful space, and, and I think um, we're going there because mutations uh, and gene expression programs and all of these things can inform and we've shown that, actually. I can talk more to you about what we've done there. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Oh. So I, I apologize if I missed it. You, you do or do not have, at this point, any juxtaposition of outcome with POG-informed therapy versus not. Because regardless of how the physicians may feel if it was informative, treating the physician's feelings, obviously, is not the goal. The goal is to have a Improved. Yeah, so we, we collect surrogates for outcome data, but the way that outcomes are tracked in BC is through dedicated outcomes units. And so different tumor sites uh, have instanti instantiated outcomes units somewhat differently. And so we have whatever data are collected now through these outcomes units. But this is not being done in the standard of uh, what one would acknowledge uh, most clinical trials would be done. And so there's a set of criteria called resist criteria uh, in which patients get a, you know, a, a PET scan at, at baseline on initiation of this, that, or the next thing, and then you know, 28 days later there's a follow-up PET scan and then beyond that. This all started primarily as a feasibility study to say could we even operate uh, with the medical oncology community. And so it was could we get the patients, could we have these interactions, could we talk genome, could we have these discussions. Uh, and so the, the business that this might actually have an impact on outcomes was a hallucination. Even so, uh, we can take patients uh, within the cohort that have had POG informed versus not, uh, and we can try and do uh, some very indefensible uh, comparisons between those two cohorts. And overall, we see a very encouraging trend, which is that the POG informed therapy people uh, do marginally better. Uh, with an average impact on lifespan of about five months. Uh, and these are all, by the way, phase one type patients. These are, these are very ill people with incurable cancers. So that's interesting. And when we go back uh, to the outcomes units, we say, well, look at this. Wouldn't you like to know a little bit more about this? And now we have the leverage we think we need to now encourage our organization to put up about 28 million in, in PET scans so that 
we can continue to do a, a proper job of evaluating response. Okay, Wilf. Hey, Wilf. So um, I was brought up in the generation that thought that patholo uh, pathologists could classify tumors uh, based on developmental stages and that that would be predictive of the, of the behavior of those tumors. And I'm looking at the literature and I'm looking at your data and I'm starting to believe that that was all a cul-de-sac and that in fact um, most tumors don't actually behave or look like uh, the classifications that have been used traditionally. I just wanted your comment on that. Well, uh, so I'll, I'll restrict my commentary to what's going on here. Um, and so uh, the patients that we're seeing are very late in their disease course in, in this little study. Uh, we need to change that, by the way. <laughs> and we think we have the ammunition to do so now, but I digress. So um, there's a pathology review which typically happens right up front. Uh, and at that point, some misdiagnoses are caught, but not many. Uh, a little bit further downstream, you know, when the genome and the transcriptome information come along, particularly the transcriptome information, uh, we, we do a sanity check and we say, well, how often does the transcriptome, uh, and I'll tell you why we use that, um, uh, uh, I guess, disagree with the pathology assignment. And most of the times, they don't disagree, actually. So where we correct a diagnosis through the transcriptome, it's pretty rare uh, and almost exclusively restricted to these things where we call them uh, primaries of unknown origin, where it's just completely opaque as to what's going on. Now, we've got a, a, a nice machine learning tool. We think it's nice. Uh, where we, we can use the gene expression information to classify uh, uh, tumors based entirely upon um, other databases that are out there. We're not generating normal information for the cell of origin because we don't know what it is uh, for these things, but you know, we have TCGA and we have ICGC and we have GTEx and we have all these wonderful resources that we can, that we can use. And, and it's a it's very, very tiny fraction of, of um, pathology assigned uh, uh, diagnoses, if you will, um, that we disagree with. And in general, uh, when that happens, it's because of this primary of unknown origin thing. So generally, you know, I think, I think we're reassured. Okay, so we're, um, it's time to wrap up. I think uh, just to um, steal a little bit of um, Dr. Beckett's uh, title from his title, uh, I think uh, if Bethune's uh, ghost is here, I think he'd be smiling down upon us. I think we've accomplished many of, um, of uh, or we've shown that uh, um, what's going on here is in line with uh, what, what he would wish, I think. So um, I think everybody should be congratulated. I'd like to uh, particularly um, thank uh, Dana. And Dana, do you have anything uh, you'd like to say? Just thank you, Ed. No, it's thank you, Dana. OK. So, so Dana, re Dana really did. Dana really, who was that? Dana really did put the, uh, the program together, and, um, and it's really been a delight. I just sort of write it down on, on her behalf. And uh, Mira and Julie, um, where are you? Wave, wave, Julie and Mira. Thank you very much. <laughs> and of course, all the volunteers, the runners, the uh, poster, poster people, the poster judges. And speaking of judges, I do have, I, it's just been sent to me. The winners of the posters. So, in third place, I have awards actually. Just fit in my pocket. How about that? Um, Emil Islam Zara, is that right? <laughs> From Dr. Hong Ma's lab. I better make sure I give the right one.
Second place was Usama Abbasari. Where are you, Abbasi? Abbasi, sorry. I should know you. And first place, Angela Mo. Angela? Hey. Now, for Angela, we have a very special prize here. Where's Mark? There you go. Okay. So, congratulations. Thank you. And that's, this is, was um, made by Mark. You can see how hard he works in the lab. This is a Canadian Blood Services funded um, creation. All right? And you can pass it around and keep that like forever. forever. All right? <laughs> I'm just making sure. Okay, so a couple of things. One, posters should come down before six, but there's drinks and I don't know what else out there, food. Um, please make sure you complete your evaluation forms. Um, this is a new venue for us. If you have constructive criticisms or comments or suggestions, or if you want to come back here versus other venues, please let us know. Um, and th I think that's all other than, could we have all the speakers that includes the student speakers, the award speakers, to um, come up for just for pictures. Is that okay, Kitty? Up here, on the stage. That's it, thank you very much. <laughs>